Oops. Oops. Did you get it? Like to open the meeting of May 13th. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. We have Spanish translation. Yes, we do. We have Alma Flores. Would you please introduce yourself? Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Alma Flores, y si necesita los servicios de un intérprete, estoy disponible. Gracias. We also have headsets for the hearing impaired, as noted on the board here. Please request them if you need them. Uh, announcements of closed session action. We've got quite a number of these. Oh my goodness. Um, on B3, maybe I can ask how I do this since I've never done this one this yes. before. Do I mention the claimant's name here? Um, no, just mention the item. Just B3 is enough? No, no, no. We don't have our... Well, let's just refer to it as item B3. Okay, on item B3 we had a... Um, Ms. Harder, um, the motion, Parker seconded. It was a uh, uh, past 5-0. On and it rejected the claim? Yes. Okay. And also on B4, we rejected the liability claim of uh, the motion by Harder, seconded by Parker, and it was 5-0. On B5, we rejected the liability claim uh, with a motion by Harder, seconded by Noel, um, and the vote was 5-0. On B7, uh, we passed uh, the Casey waivers with a vote, um, motion by Harder, second by Parker. It was 4-0 with one absent, Ms. Cordero. She hadn't arrived yet. And I believe that's all our action. Good. Uh, acceptance of donations. Move to approve with appreciation. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Nope. Mm. Accepted the uh, donations. Did you yeah. get that? Yeah. Okay. okay, introductions, proclamations, presentations, or recognitions? Well, we do have a presentation tonight. We have a number of students, outstanding students, with us tonight, and we'll recognize them for the National Merit Scholarship Program finalists and Merit Scholar Financial Award recipients. Uh, this year, our district had 21 National Merit Scholar Program semifinalists and 48 commended students. In the spring, 20 of those semifinalists advanced to finalist standing, and several of our students also received Merit Scholar Financial Awards. Other college-based financial awards in the program will be released later this month, so we'll be letting you know about that. Before I introduce these distinguished students, I would like to note that this year's competition began in October 2006 when more than 1.4 million juniors over 21,000 high schools took the preliminary SAT, the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, which served as an initial screen of program entrance. Students, I'm going to call your name and say a little something about you. I know you provided us even more information, and I won't be reading all of that this evening, but we will use that in the press release so that we do want to get it into the media. Well, from Santa Barbara High School, we have a couple of finalists that we would like to recognize. Uh, the first is Cole Patterson, who is the recipient of a 2,500 National Merit Scholarship Award, $2,500 National Merit Scholarship Award. He will attend Stanford and plans to major in engineering and material science. Cole, you're not with us tonight. Darn. I was going to give him a... <laughs> yes. And the next honoree... Uh, Brett Silverman is also unable to be here tonight. He has a CIF volleyball match, and he will also receive 
uh, Cash Scholarship Award and will attend Dartmouth and be studying engineering. Well, we have a number of finalists. We do have a number of finalists because I saw some of them. From San Marcos High School, Alexander Kafitz Gaum will attend Yale where he participate where he anticipates majoring in philosophy. Alexander? <laughs> Alexander, just stay right up here, please. Good. And Kristen Hempe plans to attend Westmont College. She hasn't decided on a major, but maybe she has decided by tonight. Kristen? <laughs> <laughs> Nari Miller, please come up. Nari will be going to Williams College in Massachusetts. Or she can't tell us what her major is then. Landon Rank is the recipient of a $2,500 National Merit Scholarship Award. He will attend Gordon College in Boston and major in graphic design. And Justin Fang is headed to UC Berkeley, where he will major in bioengineering. Justin? I thought I saw Justin earlier. Kristen Scherer will attend USC and study biomedical engineering. <laughs> biomedical engineering with a biochemical emphasis. USC awarded her a full tuition scholarship plus the $2,500 per year National Merit Scholarship. Congratulations. And a number of finalists from Dos Pueblos High School. Erica Bildston received a $2,500 National Merit Scholarship. Come on up. She will attend MIT where she will major in physics or mechanical engineering. <laughs> Sounds like just the right thing for an engineering student. DP Engineering. Kevin Chang will attend Princeton University. <laughs> Julia Cooperman will attend USC. She's planning a double major in neuroscience and creative writing. <laughs> Isabel Dewey will attend UC Berkeley and major in cognitive science. Sarah Ellsworth will attend Brigham Young University where she will major in molecular biology and minor in microbiology. <laughs> Scott Martinez uh, will attend the U.S. Naval Academy. <laughs> Wait, we have more. Joseph McDaniel will attend UC Berkeley where he will major in electrical engineering computer science with a simultaneous degree in economics. <laughs> Rachel McPhail is going to Texas A&M University as a biomedical science pre-veterinary major. <laughs> J.R. Riggs will attend Stanford JR, have you selected a major? <laughs> you know, you have plenty of time. Don't be in a rush about it. Uh, Leah Savage, I believe, is going to go to UCLA and major in English, right? Good. <laughs> and Wei Wu will be attending UC Berkeley. Finally, Nicole Zock will attend Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. <laughs> Nicole, we just all love to say that. <laughs> well, please join me, audience, in congratulating these fine students.
And students, we know that you reflect the support and encouragement of your families and teachers, moms and dads and other family members. Would you please stand so that the students and I can applaud the nurturing environment you have provided throughout the years. Now students, this will be televised Saturday night, 5 o'clock, channel 18. <laughs> I know, you're not doing homework that time. You can watch this. You're allowed, to go, home. You're allowed to go home now and study some more. I <laughs> Although, congratulations to everybody. This is just, we are very proud of you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming in today. <laughs> I know we, we also want to uh, express appreciation for the teachers and administrators of the students' schools who also give them tremendous support. Ms. Cordero, I think that was part of the nurturing environment <laughs> he was referring to. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have a student report tonight? Oh, superintendent's report. Yes, please. Excuse me. On April 23rd, a number of us went to UCSB's Gewurz Graduate School of Education reception where Dr. Sally Kingston, principal of Harding Elementary School, was recognized. Sally received a Distinguished Educational Alumni Award, and it was, of course, very refreshing to listen to her remarks on her focus on staff and students. Let me refer you to the board brief for, the, for a minute. The board brief is a collection of reports and articles on school and district matters. A copy is on display in the reception area or can be found in my office. In the May 2nd board brief, the board saw a number of items. Uh, among them were a report on the electives provided by each junior high school. Uh, this next year, the projected electives at each of the junior highs, a report on the actual class sizes at our high schools last year, the majority of which were below the contracted maximum class size, and the additional cost of organic plates, cups, and sporks for Harding School's composting program, some $30,000 a year, which will be paid for by Harding School. Other items. Homeschool Santa Barbara is a proposed program for homeschooled students with school resources. It will be coming to the board for discussion at our next board meeting. Pat Morales has scheduled information gathering meetings for tonight and May 20. And we will see here at our next meeting. The Dos Pueblos High School Economics Challenge Team led by teacher Roland Lewis placed second in the Economics Challenge West Regional Championship on April 29. Representing California, they outscored teams from the 10 other states in the region to advance as the first place team to the Quiz Bowl. They came up a little bit short on the Quiz Bowl, but they finished the fifth ranked team in the nation. And each of the four team members won a $500, a $500 U.S. savings bond to go along with the $150 cash award that they won for the state championship. Roland recently learned that Dos Pueblos was the highest scoring team in the nation in the three qualifying exams, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and international trade current events. This is the second year in a row that Dos Pueblos had be, has been the top scoring team in the nation. And we congratulate, um, congratulate Mr. Lewin and the team. Uh, we wanted to bring them to tonight's meeting, but they have other things scheduled, so we'll have to bring them to a future meeting. 
Our secondary district's graduation promotion schedule is posted on the web and accessible from the home page. And I'd like to note that uh, Goleta Valley High School's promotion has been changed to 9.30, as it was previously shown as 10 o'clock. Um, Goleta Valley Junior High School's <laughs> promotion. And board members, well, I'll hand these to you later under upcoming events so that you can see where you stand on this list. Uh, coming up in the days ahead, it is that busiest time of the year. Once again, we have plays, we have concerts. It seems like just everything is happening. Roosevelt Schools celebrating the Creative Child Art Exhibition is on display at Arts Alive through May 31st. Santa Barbara High's performance of Beauty and the Beast continues on the 15th, 16th, and 17th. La Cumbre Junior High will present Gary, well, that already happened. <laughs> La Colina Junior High's advanced concert band, jazz band, and drumline spring concert takes place on May 15. Goleta Valley Junior High's beginning and advanced band concert will be held on May 20. San Marcos High's beginning and, band and advanced band concert will take place on May 20. Dos Pueblos High School will present Beauty and the Beast on May 22 through 24. Goleta Valley Junior High's Jazz Ensemble and Orchestra will perform on May 29. Santa Marcos High School will hold a vocal music concert on May 29. San, uh, Santa Barbara High School's annual spring choral concerts, a cappella choir, madrigal singers, men's and women's ensembles will take place on May 30, 31st, and June 1st. And La Cumbre Junior High will perform Hello Dolly on June 4, 6, and 7. Uh, you can find more information about these on the district website. Uh, Mr. Hetyung, can you get that website put up? It's www.sbsdk12, uh, and that's our district website that has a lot of information about the district and has uh, always has updated information about upcoming events. And finally, tonight is Paul Turnbull's last board meeting with Santa Barbara School Districts. Paul Turnbull has been our assistant superintendent for secondary education and will be going on to the Santa Inez School District as superintendent. That's our meeting tonight, and that's our uh, report tonight. We wish you the best, Mr. Trimble. Uh, um, student report. Well, we do have students with us. Uh, with us tonight is outgoing Santa Barbara High School student representatives, Brian Rouse, soon to be attending USC. And next year's school representative, Luce Cordova. Yeah, and next year's ASB president. Yes. Uh, and your name? Uh, me. I'm Brian Deso. Next year I'll be junior president. Brian, good. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, at Santa Barbara High School, uh, we are soon going to be starting our summer school. That's June, begins June 18th, and we are mostly uh, doing remediation, but we also have uh, some work in the AVID program. We have a video production that will be helping students, I suppose, our, uh, will would benefit by having a multimedia approach to education. And uh, other than that, I just have a lot of good sports news to report. So we have four Channel League championships in golf, tennis, swimming, and volleyball. Golf won the CIF regional, uh, was second in CIF sectional, and are on their way to the state competitions. Uh, that is boys tennis is playing this afternoon against Thousand Oaks in the second round of CIF. Swimming, let's see, we have Lindsay Parrish set a school record in the butterfly and was just four tenths off of Olympic qualifying time. Right, four tenths of a second, I guess. Yeah. Uh, in boys volleyball, uh, they play tonight against Santa Ana and a win will place them in the quarterfinals on Friday night. Uh, Daniel Nguyen and Lindsay Parrish are both high school All-American scholars. And uh, overall, varsity athletes finished last semester with a 3.4 non-weighted GPA. 20 of 22 teams were above a 3.0, and boys volleyball was the academic champion of the CIF large schools. All right. And now, Luz Cordova with some other news. Hi. OK, 
Okay, so what's going on at Santa Barbara High School? For a theater, our play Beauty and the Beast was a big hit last weekend. It had so far one show sold out, and it's playing again this weekend coming up, and the last day is Saturday. And coming up, we have our sixth annual Wall of Fame. It's honoring six outstanding alumni students, such as Tom Curran, which is a three-time world champion sur surfer who attended our school, and Sam Bam Cunningham. He's a professional football player. And our ceremony is happening Friday at 1 p.m. in our theater, which all of you are invited to attend. And right now, we um, are working on prom, which is June 7th. And Seniors are excited. It's a new location at the Orwar Showgrounds. And our blood drive is Thursday, and we have more than 30 st students who signed up to donate blood. And our talent show is coming up as well. That's pretty much it. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. You got something else? Go ahead. Okay, um, my name is Brian Joseph, I already told you that. I'm from Santa Barbara High School, I'm a sophomore, and I'm here to talk about food. So, oh, hold on just a second. Yeah. I'm gonna call you for public comment oh, okay. in just like five seconds, yeah. once she closes that up, and then. <laughs> so we're done with the student reports, that was the end of that. Thank you so much. Now, do we have public comments? We do have public comments. <laughs> 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 And <laughs> first off, we'll have Brian Joseph from Santa Barbara High School come speak. Back. All right. All right, so there's three areas I'd like to talk about, which are quality of food, the availability of food, and funding, how we're going to fund better food in the schools. Um, first, I'll talk about quality. So the cafeteria and student store at our schools, they've, they've been working really hard to improve quality, um, and they've done a really great job. Um, but I think they could do better. Um, the cafeteria does not offer the most wholesome food meals. Anything that is processed, reheated, or artificial is not good for kids. And I understand that not having an actual cafeteria hinders this process, but I think we're working on that. Um, but the thing is, why do we not have a cafeteria? We have 2,300 kids, you know? Most public schools have cafeterias, am I not? Is that correct? Okay, so we're working on that. Um, and SBHS just recently had the STAR testing which is the state ta standard testing which all kids have to take. And it was a major concern that our school would not perform up to standards. Well, kids do not function very well when they're eating things like Pop-Tarts, chips, or even worse, nothing at all. Imagine trying to focus on a chemistry test when you've eaten nothing for lunch, maybe some Pop-Tarts. Well, I can tell you because I've done it, actually, and I did not do very well on my test. I got like a C, which is not very good. Um, and the reason why I ate Pop-Tarts was because the closest available food to my chemistry class was a vending machine. And one thing I don't understand is why do we have vending machines? I mean, we have our, our student store, which is working really hard, our soon-to-be cafeteria. Why do we have vending machines? Especially with the stuff they have in it, which is like uh, chocolate power bars, which are pretty much candy bars in disguise, uh, fruit gummies, chips, um, Pop-Tarts, which are terrible for you. Um, so why do we have these? That's just my question. Um, and also there have been studies done to associate that with unhealthy weights, with poor academic performance, behavior issue, behavioral issues, and attendance. And these three issues um, are central to, are, are very important, are, these three issues are the biggest issues facing Santa Barbara High School today. We have a problem with attendance, our behavior, we don't have a very good uh, history with good behavior, and our test, or, test scores are not very good. Um, Okay, so why did I have these, these Pop-Tarts? Because they're cheap and they're available. What we need to do is we need to eliminate the bad option. We need, and we only need to provide good options. Because imagine, I mean, what are kids gonna do? Are kids gonna choose uh, string cheese? We're offering string cheese, cheese, which is good. Or are they gonna choose Pop-Tarts? You have 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. Um, the biggest excuse I hear for this whole fiasco is that there's not enough money. But I would like to point out to you there's school food initiatives, which is, um, a local organization that's working to improve food in the schools. I think we could work with them. That would be great. Um, and also, I think that another important or essential issue to this is that physical activity. I think that PE, Mr. Gorgita is our PE teacher. He does a great job, but I think it could be improved. I think that um, some I've observed PE uh, classes, and can I say one more quick thing? Quick. Um, and what they do is they walk around the track. 
this is not a very fun thing to do. This is not, I mean, it's even a, it's a poor excuse for exercise. So what can we do to get kids excited about exercising? Um, thank you. Um, Could we? Dr. Sarvis, uh, as, as the board representative to the wellness committee, yes. I would extend an invitation to students to participate on the wellness committee next year. Our final meeting is this Wednesday afternoon, but we've been meeting for an entire year to deal exactly with the issues that Mr. Joseph has raised tonight. Um, and we more than welcome student participation. We've had really great participation from San Marcos, but uh, representation from the other two high schools would be fantastic. I had already written your name down and I'll be sending Brian Joseph a, uh, an invitation. I, I think it's also timely for us to just comment briefly, Dave, on the uh, status of, of the cafeteria at Santa Barbara High School. The cafeteria at Santa Barbara High School is currently at the Division of State Architect for review. Uh, when we originally started to renovate the cafeteria, when we started the demolition process, we discovered that the infrastructure was much more deteriorated than what the plans and the contract had indicated. It was in the district's best interest to terminate that contract and, and redesign the project. We did that with board approval. And that redesign is currently with the Division of State Architect. It's been submitted. It's had an initial review. And the three areas that it's being reviewed for, uh, ADA accessibility, uh, structural and fire life safety, I believe the architect has received the first round of comments, is making the changes required by the Division of State Architect, and is the process of resubmittal. I, I, I also just wanted to have a quick question about the vending machines and I thought we had already eliminated a lot of those um, unhealthy options from vending machines. I thought we Is, had too. I was surprised to hear chips come up, for I example. Pop tarts. Well, that's yeah. that's in, exactly right. In fact, we've even had audits. So the, the wellness uh, committee that, that Mrs. Harder referred to a little bit earlier has individuals from the school two individuals from Santa Barbara High School who have gone around and taken a look at the vending machines and we were under the impression that that had been taken care of. So we'll look into that. I've got a note. Next we have Richard Foster. Uh, I'm Richard Foster. I enjoyed that. That was great. Um, I'm here about the stadium lights at DP, once again. We got to experience the, the stadium light loudspeakers at their low level the other night, last Thursday night. And I'm representing 20 families on our block who have signed a petition to the school district to abide by the rules that were originally portrayed to the community. Um, we have a petition. The petition reads, we the undersigned neighbors of Dos Pueblos High School request that the district abide by the promises made to the community that all non-football events would cease to use the stadium lights at 8 p.m. We find the negative impacts referred to in the negative mitigated draft are indeed significant. We believe that loudspeakers and blaring blazing lights have no place in a residential area on a school night, unquote. Uh, 20 of my neighbors signed that. One person declined because he wasn't around the night they used the speakers and he felt he could sign it articulately. Not any other person declined to sign this. Uh, when the project for the stadium line was first proposed at Dos Pueblos, we were told, and page 28, 29 of the negative draft says this, that other than football, others, all other sporting events would cease no later than 8 p.m. The district now puts forward that the addendum has changed that whereby you can have any activity you want until 11 o'clock at night, any night of the week. Uh, this is a 180 degree reversal from what was put forward in the original negative deck. It's either an erroneous assumption on the part of staff or the district intentionally misled the public and put forth a CEQA document that was intentionally misleading because you can't go 180 degrees away and say we're going to have noise until 11 potentially any night of the week from where you started off with having it on Friday nights. This argument that somehow you can have the only uh, I talked to three staff members. Their conclusion was that the only thing that's restricted until 8 o'clock is football practice, which is rather curious that football team needs to stop at 8, but the band can go until 11. It's patently absur absurd for the following reasons. First of all, it's 180 degrees opposite. Secondly, <clears throat> it's, it assumes that somehow the mitigated draft, when, it's, when it mentioned the football team, wiped out all the other mitigations that were required. Nowhere in the addendum did it ever discuss changing the hours. Uh, for example, one of the issues was the track, which was the most recent thing. It says early evening hours. 
yet they were listed in the original mitigated draft as early evening hours, and their original mitigated draft said no later than 8 p.m., and yet the other night they were going until 10 to 8 with the loudspeakers. Um, sec uh, thirdly, this claims that you can go until 11 o'clock at night, which is patently absurd, seeing public nuisance ordinances kick in at 10 o'clock. Um, fourthly, uh, nowhere in the denim to discuss these changes. About a third of the families on our street have young children who are in bed by 8 o'clock. All the people I talked to were horrified at the noise level they're having during the week with this. Uh, we're afraid it only will get worse. Dan Choi told me that he thought I might complain, which makes you wonder whether this was a trial balloon to see if you could get away with it or if they just kind of knew they were pushing the envelope here. We ask that the board clarify the position and return to what the original statement was in the original deck, which was 8 o'clock for stuff other than football. Uh, the addendum adopted JV football for going past the 8 o'clock limit, and varsity football always was. I understand, my understanding was that varsity football practice was mentioned as an 8 o'clock cap, not because it was the one exception, but because it was the only thing that could actually go past 8 o'clock previously. Therefore, to avoid confusion, it was limited to that. Okay, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Uh, we will follow up on this. Mr. Foster has been in touch with everyone here, emails, phone calls. Uh, in fact, I believe that the school's use of the track does demonstrate a concern for the neighbors, and we do want to be good neighbors. We will be using, and I'm glad to get this list because um, I believe he is incorrect in his assertion the negative deck says early evening if sunset is 750 then that doesn't mean eight o'clock it means early evening for track events uh, we'll be meeting with you we will be meeting with you and we don't appreciate the rude gestures well we will be banning you from the campus, Mr. Foster. Okay, we have two more public speakers. Uh, Ken Locke. My name is Kenneth Locke. Uh, I stood before the city council today and I mentioned that I'd be paying you guys a visit. Um, I mentioned the whole concept of a protest. And I'd like to protest um, this form of education that you're providing the children. And I want to promote, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you guys consider this uh, form of education that you're providing to children with as interdisciplinary. Uh, I'm sorry to say that it's, it, it, it's not up to the standard. There's, a, there's actually a standard in relation to uh, intelligence, IQ. Um, that's, uh, I'm going to bring a, a kind of a contest along with this protest and the contest, maybe we'll do it next year when uh, it's a little late in the year, but with the teachers, uh, we can actually measure their uh, IQ in relation to interdisciplinary, in relation to their own relationship. So the contest will be uh, to ask them um, how they are uh, interdisciplined and then through what particular disciplines do they integrate and then, um, as I mentioned to you before, I'm claiming to be a, a renaissance genius, a genius of a renaissance. And my renaissance is understood in relation to the integration of all disciplines. And uh, my, my background is uh, claiming to have mastered the exercise or the discipline of painting and actually explain what it actually truly means to master that discipline. And then I back it up with athletics through tennis. I show how tennis is a ambidextrous, non-competitive relationship. And um, so I have a pretty good hand of cards. So I'm um, gonna challenge uh, your teachers to a contest to see if actually there is a teacher within your, say, district or your, that actually can beat my hand. And then from my, from my perspective, then we can go down and identify uh, your teacher's level of intelligence in relation to multiple disciplines. And I think it'll be important for um, this school to identify that. I think it's, um, I'm not sure if you provide, are they uh, an IQ test for your teachers and understand how they're relative to a standard? I'm not sure, I don't think you, you do uh, have a test. 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, so um, 
here, here I am promoting interdisciplinary, and the basis of that, um, again, maybe next year, uh, I'll raise this up and uh, a contest for your teachers. And then maybe if they can just write a sh short essay explaining the whole basis of their interdisciplinary relationship. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, for public comment, we have Shireen Katapush. Good evening. I just wanted to take a moment of your time and draw your attention to this measuring up report uh, facing the challenge of substance abuse. The district kindly provided much of the data that's reported in here and a number of community partners contributed data and I think it does a great job of telling us kind of where we are, what we've been doing well and also points in some good directions for the future. Um, the report includes some good data on um, the programs that we've been implementing in partnership with you in the schools and the success of those programs. And there's a great section in the back called um, Taking Action, and it gives great um, advice for different things that sectors of the community can do to affect, positively affect substance abuse among youth. So I wanted to thank you for your contribution to this report. We had a terrific um, youth and community speak out last Thursday night. Um, some of the schools were there, and lots of kids were there, and they were really brave in talking about substance abuse in their lives and how it's affecting them, <coughs> pardon me. Um, so that was a terrific community conversation that we had. Thank you for being part of it. And if you'd ever like us to come back and give you a more lengthy report on this, we'd be glad to do that. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay. We can move on to the consent agenda. Does anyone want to pull anything? I think I do, actually. I have one thing, which is the D13. Uh, D5 and D11. D3, D10, D13. <laughs> D, I heard D3, D5, Uh, if nothing else, move to approve the remainder. Second. Motion by Harder, second by Cordero. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Passes 5 0. We'll come back to those items at the end. So we're now on to E1, the third reading of the proposed Santa Barbara School District's discipline guidelines and dress code. Good. Let, let me just introduce this before uh, Mr. Gonzalez uh, speaks about it. Uh, you've seen this before. Uh, there has been board comment about a couple of items. One of the items was in the conduct code, uh, whether students who are in possession under the influence or use of any controlled substance, alcoholic beverage, or intoxicant uh, should have the, the right to a uh, a third, uh, a second chance, actually. And uh, we've done a bit of talking about this. Um, it's clear to me that uh, sites need to have uh, students who are repeat offenders moved off of their campuses. It's also clear to me that if we're to produce the kind of change we need to produce in these students, we need to move them into a program. And simply expelling them, I don't think, is the answer. And you'll hear a proposal from Mr. Gonzalez in a moment uh, that asks uh, that, that we be given time to develop an appropriate program. Uh, I have talked with uh, a number of people about uh, issues such as um, zero suspension, zero expulsion, where uh, the idea is that what we really need to produce is the behavior change that we need in students so that based on offenses, you move them into an appropriate program, uh, you don't simply expel them. Mr. Gonzalez is our Director of Compliance. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as the superintendent shared with you, our recommendation at this time is that the board approve uh, the uh, discipline guidelines and the dress code as presented to you, minus the consequences 
for uh, discipline uh, guideline number seven and that you permit a study group to be convened of school administrators and the uh, uh, folks that have uh, provided you input and permit us to get together, study this issue more in depth and come back to you with a recommendation. I will also share with you that uh, based on the two previous conversations, we have uh, the assistant principals who have been working on this proposal have submitted additional language. It is underlined uh, in the uh, discipline guidelines and I'll be more than happy to review those uh, additions uh, with you and answer any questions that you might have regarding the uh, revisions. Um, I, I really appreciate that recommendation of uh, dealing with number seven in a different sort of way. Uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, I think the board probably appreciates it. I, I won't speak for them. I certainly do. Um, but I would also like to do the same thing with number 29. I'm not suggesting have a study session, um, but I would actually like to, to vote uh, and leave number 29 out. Um, I think that certainly as a board member, uh, I could benefit from a little more feedback. I was speaking to someone who, uh, from one of the high schools, a teacher from one of the high schools who said that their academic senate had actually had a discussion with regard to it and had suggestions. Um, and I don't know if that kind of activity has taken place at the other high schools and uh, the feedback could be brought forward to the board and may have some uh, impact on uh, on number 29. In fact, what this person suggested on the phone was were consequences that were in some ways much harsher than what have been suggested here. So I'm not sure how to strike a balance. I think that a little more feedback might, might be helpful. Ms. Parker. Um, I agree with Mrs. Harder on number 29. Um, there have been some cases just in California recently where students did things like on their first offense, they were stealing tests or, and sharing them or selling them. Um, and uh, breaking into computers and tampering with grades and things that are much more serious than like a first, if you just classify it as a first offense, um, it, it really wouldn't match up with what the, the um, discipline is here. So I do think that that's something that just needs to be pulled off and, and have more study done. I also have a question on number 18. <clears throat> Harassment, threats or intimidation, including electronic transmissions and or against witnesses. Is something missing and or? Harassment, threats or intimidation against witnesses. Why is it and or at the end? Uh, it, it probably should just be um, a comma or an and. Well, actually, uh, I, I believe that the wording was designed to be very comprehensive. So it applied to harassments, threats, intimidation, electronic transmissions uh, that were construed as harassment, threats, or intimidation, and uh, any harassment, threats, or intimidation against witnesses. And we can clarify that language. I just wasn't sure if it was meeting yes. electronic transmissions and or some other way of, of uh, having a harassment or threat. So that's, that well, was a question it, for me. It, it is intended to be harassment, threats, or intimidation toward others, including electronic transmissions. So you mean including via electronic transmissions? Including via electronic transmissions. But it's not just against others. It's also against witnesses. Mm -hmm. um. As the resident English teacher, I would like to recommend that we change, that we clarify the wording on that one. We will do it. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Cordero. Well, I wanted to actually um, echo some of the things that have already been said. First of all, I, I also appreciate the recommendation for number seven. Um, I would, I would welcome. Uh, a fuller discussion and program that that would entail. Um, I also had a question about 18, which was addressed. 
29 was one that was added, and I, I think that this has maybe been addressed, but I was hoping that, again, as, a, as an instructor, I shared some of the same concerns um, that Ms. Parker was raising, that in some cases, in, in cases that I've encountered personally, the recommendations listed here do not seem um, significant enough for the kind of offenses that can occur. But I mostly want, wondered if faculty, if teachers in the district had been uh, queried about their recommendations for this particular item. Uh, I do not know, but uh, I will uh, work with the association president to uh, query faculty regarding the consequences for item number 29. Okay, thank you. In, in addition, I had um, questions regarding the notes at the bottom. I was under the impression that at our last meeting, we had agreed that the cell phone policy would not apply during lunch period. Uh, correct. If I can clarify, I went back to the assistant principals and they clarified for me that they are not currently in support of using or permitting students except in emergencies to use cell phones during the lunch period. They explained to me that there's been several incidences at a number of different schools where uh, not the cell phone but the picture function in a cell phone was uh, used in a very inappropriate manner and they believed that uh, the safety of students uh, required that we continue to ban their use uh, except in cases of emergency. And so that's the recommendation that I've presented to you folks. Okay. Um, hmm. It seems to me that at least the cases that I'm aware of, those the, the concerns about the pictures were issues that kind of went beyond the use of the cell phone and involved sort of inappropriate uh, activities in, in other regards as well. But uh, we, can, we can discuss that further, I guess. The other question I had was um, the language that was added in number five. Uh, misuse of electronic devices uh, can result in additional legal and school consequences. Misuse of electronic devices regardless of time and place that disrupt the educational environment will also result in application of these disciplinary rules. And I was wondering um, if we, if we had, if, if these, if what is meant by the misuse of electronic devices is what we've included earlier in some of these other, for example, in number 30, or is there additional uh, behavior or activities that we mean to include in that language? I, I don't think so. I, I will okay. share with you that uh, if you've had an opportunity to look at uh, disciplinary guidelines for other districts, you may know that the guidelines that are being proposed are much more specific. In general, you will find most school districts, their statements are fairly generic. These guidelines, and I stress the word guidelines, uh, they are, uh, the assistant principals and the principals will uh, use these guidelines to deal with students appropriately. So I think what, you're, what you have before you is a generic blanket statement designed to protect students and faculty from misuse of electronic devices. I'm wondering if we are addressing the disciplinary p section separately from the dress code? That's what I was thinking okay. we would do. Okay. So let's just do the first part and then we'll get to the second part. Uh, Ms. We, Ms. I just want to just clarify that we do have speakers that are just for the overall E1, so I just okay, want we'll you to get be aware to that. of that. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, Ms. Harder, did you want to no, say No, I was going to make a motion, but why don't we wait until we've had a chance to hear from some speakers. speakers. Okay. How about if we ask the speakers if they'd like to speak on this first part as opposed to the dress code? We're splitting it up. So 
At some point, I'd I like think, to oh, um, go ahead. say something. Oh. I think some speakers are, are sp want to speak on both. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yes, I, uh, I make a, ver uh, a very, as clear a distinction as I can between the items on here, the offenses on here that involve violence or potential violence and the offenses that don't. And, uh, and I'm very concerned that uh, a number of them that involve uh, violence or threats of violence have, uh, uh, don't have severe enough consequences. And I'm concerned about deterrent effects. No one wants to punish kids, but you would like to, like to be able to deter other kids by virtue of how you handle a particular case. And uh, so number one, I would, like to, I would like to be able to vote on those separately rather than putting all this one lock, stock, and barrel, and I can make a generalization about those. But the particular one, if I'm not, if that doesn't work, if I'm not able to do that, I'm concerned with numbers one and numbers 27 because they have to do with how teachers uh, are, are, what are the consequences for uh, misconduct with respect to teachers. Number one, assault and or battery on a school employee. That includes a teacher. Assault and or battery. And the consequence is five days suspension and possible expulsion. And uh, uh, there's a distinction between that and a number of items in here that don't say possible expulsion, they say expulsion. In my case, on that one, it would be certain expulsion. Uh, uh, upbr upbraiding, insulting, or abusing a teacher. Uh, that doesn't even get uh, a, uh, the possibility of expulsion. It says five days expansion, parent conference, teen court services, or possible law enforcement notification. Fortunately, in my teaching career, I never had these things happen. But uh, I have had calls occasionally from teachers in our system who have. Uh, not the physical violence, but the upbraiding, uh, uh, the verbal abuse, uh, and intimidation of teachers. And, I, and it's so fundamental to the function of, our, of, of schools that teachers have security and assurance that, that's not, that, that they can do their job without fear of, uh, of physical or any other kind of abuse. But I, I just feel that we, I, I would, I, at, at the appropriate time, I want to make a motion that those two items be uh, five days suspension and recommendation for expulsion. So are you saying on number one that your suggestion is to get rid of the possible and make get it Get rid of the possible on number one mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and on number 25, get rid of, you mean number get rid of them all and replace the, the, the number one. Uh, which basically says suspension and recommendation for expulsion. Treat them both identically. They have to do with those. Uh, 27. 27. I didn't mean. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. 27. They have. It just has to do with the fundamental function of teaching. Uh, can I comment on that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. One of the reasons why, uh, although I don't object, I, I'd actually like 27 read the way that number one reads now. Um, but I don't object to the possible expulsion because I think one of the things, especially in number 27, is if we require it to be an, a, a, an expellable offense, then we, I think we tend to interpret it much more strictly. And the student, the, the behavior has to rise to something, to a level that we would consider expellable before we identify that the student has violated this code. If we leave it somewhat, um, I don't want to say general, but I want to say um, that there's a sort of a continuum, then uh, there might be, uh, I mean, a student could be held accountable for, the, for this violation, even if the uh, upbraiding or insulting were not s to the extent that we might consider it an uh, expellable offense, but certainly something that we would not want teachers to have to endure. Um, so, and I think we might tie our hands a little bit if we require it to be expellable because then we're less likely to enforce it on lesser, a lesser level of violation. 
And so, but I wouldn't mind adding possible recommendation for expulsion uh, to the first offense on number 27 if it rose to that level. I will share with you that, that I would have no objection to the rewrites as proposed. I share with you that one of the concepts that is important in student discipline is the idea of is there any other means of correction? And school officials are not authorized to proceed with a recommendation to expel if there is other means of correction. Uh, the safety of our faculty is important and in no way uh, would this district want to jeopardize the uh, the great responsibilities that teachers have? And so I would have no objection to a rewrite as specified by Dr. Noel. Mr. Gonzalez, uh, is there any of these? One, one little I'm, clarification. I'm sorry. Can I just clarify one little thing from that? I'll give you your time back. Just okay. Just is there any of these that have automatic expulsions, or are they all say possible expulsion? No, no. Some of them are wrong. There, by, by education code, there are a number of items okay, that I a principal okay, has sorry. no choice. Excuse me for recommend. interrupting then. Yeah, I then. just wanted to clarify your comment, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. So you think that it should say and recommendation without not possible recommendation? I, I would share with you that, uh, that part of my responsibility is to implement the wishes of the board. And if the board believes that uh, not including very clear language that under no circumstances are we going to permit uh, an assault or battery or severe upbraiding or insulting of a teacher that I would support that language. I, I want to remind uh, the audience, the board, that there is a due process here that a recommendation to expel uh, puts the young person before an administrative hearing panel that decides if there is sufficient evidence to proceed with a recommendation to expel to the board. And so there is a number of safeguards. Uh, nothing is automatic except for those zero tolerance policies uh, that are specified in Ed Code. I also think, though, that our, our tradition has been progressive discipline, correct? correct. And there, that is the basis of uh, first, second, and third offense, right. correct? Right. Yeah, you asked, uh, are there any others in here that, that say suspension and recommendation for expulsion without the possible? No, I, uh, I actually nine, thought it was nine. mandatory. Well, I, that's a very important point because it goes to Mrs. Cordero's comment because yeah, there right. are items in there that do not have possible but simply uh, five-day suspension and recommendation for for expulsion, uh, robbery and or extortion, uh, willful causing serious injury to another person, uh, sexual assault, uh, brandishing a knife or explosive or, uh, or possession of, of any firearm, uh, offering to sell, offering or selling controlled substances, uh, all have uh, do, do not have the word possible. Yeah, I thought you were asking whether it could say mandatory, and yeah. these are all recommendations yeah. for expulsion, yeah. and, 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 and that uh, makes and more and sense as, to me. As Mr. Gonzalez says, there, there is a due process. Uh, my, the, 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 point, the point I make is simply, uh, it's about deterrence, and we, we understand deterrence pretty well by now. And, uh, and deterrence requires Wiggle room and ambiguity are antithetical deterrent to deterrence, period. I'll wait. I'll wait until we hear our comments. Uh, actually, what I think we'll do is we'll do the dress code. We'll talk about that, and then we'll have the comments. I think that makes most sense, rather than doing comments twice. So um, I did want to say one thing. I, I kind of had some second thoughts about the cell phone also the same note that you you mentioned about lunchtime and I'm not sure where how whether there's some compromise in there s somewhere but let's move on to the dress code while we're going to that. Any, there isn't well, many changes here was there and I, no and, and I'm I kind of surprised I have a lot of concerns with this still um, so I'll just identify them um, in the Introduction, introductory paragraph under general, um, about midway through it, uh, again, the section that I quoted previously regarding haircuts, 
but it also says or any other attribute which denotes membership in a gang and then later under dress code um where it says student dress codes may restrict wearing gang related apparel with the following conditions and b says the school provides a reasonable description of the restricted apparel and i'm wondering how any other attribute is a reasonable definition I've shared with you in, in previous meetings that uh, assistant principals and principals take the totality of the situation. I will share with you that the uh, wording regarding gang clothing, gang hairstyles, uh, comes from school resource officers whose experiences at this time lead them to believe that this is the kind of clothing, this is the kind of hair that should be banned. I shared with you uh, in a previous uh, board meeting that it's been my experiences uh, as a school administrator that uh, it's not just clothing that administrators look at. It is behavior, it is a combination of behavior as well as clothing. These guidelines are designed to give administrators uh, a direction, an ability to sit down with a young person, to sit down with their parents and say that at this time, this kind of clothing, this kind of behavior will not be tolerated on our campus. I know that everyone here is concerned about student safety. I remind, uh, ourselves, including myself, that just last week our police chief announced that uh, at least three minors uh, were arrested for the second murder that took place a year ago. Uh, we continue to be in a very high-risk environment, and I am obligated uh, as a, a staff member to make recommendations to the board, to the superintendent regarding student safety. You shared that you were surprised that I did not come back with any changes. I'd be remiss at this time if I brought forth changes that our system principals and principals believe are critical for the safety of schools. Can I go on? Um, okay, well, I, I have a I have a real concern with I've I've spoke to Dr. Sarvis about this after the previous meeting um, when you say that it's going to be in conjunction with student behavior again um, my concern is that I think I have no objections to a dress code a reasonable dress code that is re that is reasonably well defined um, I do have some concerns about a policy that is going to be applied to some students and not to others um, based on how, what the student's behavior is. So if the suggestion is that a student who behaves one way can wear certain attire and a student who behaves another way cannot wear certain attire, I, f I find that problematic um, and I'm, am, I'm always concerned that if students perceive a policy as being unreasonable and at, at best and at worst discriminatory or um, targeting them, that it actually creates a much more hostile environment than it resolves. Um, and I don't want that to happen um, with this policy because I think that the purpose of the policy, as you stated well, is to create an environment that is safe and um, productive for our students. So I, I don't want to implement something that's actually going to have an unintended consequence. But when you said um, these kinds of hairstyles, um, could you describe a hairstyle? I think that it's very common knowledge in Santa Barbara that uh, youngsters who are gang members have a very short style of hair. 
I shared with you in a previous conversation that there has been cases in our schools where it just wasn't hair that uh, students uh, cut their hair in styles that very clearly identified themselves as gang members with W's referring to West Side or E's referring to East Side. I will share with you that should you approve this dress code, it will be applied to all students. However, there is always going to be, and the law requires discretion. The law requires, due process requires, that every student be judged individually. We walk a very difficult line in applying any kind of guideline. We always have. I will share with you that it has been my experience that in this district, our assistant principals and principals use very wise judgment in deciding what is and isn't permissible in our schools. I will share with you that we are in a situation where we're attempting to ad address a, I will share with you, a growing gang problem. And this will be a tool that will permit our system principals and principals to continue to keep our schools safe. In the same breath, I will share with you that as the Board of Education, you have the ability, the final word, to direct staff on the implementation of these guidelines that we will abide by. Well, let me continue. Um, item five it says, consistent with these guidelines, it says hair sideburns, but I'm assuming there's supposed to be a comma there. Hair, sideburns, mustaches, and beards may be worn at any length or style and clothing may be of any fashion style or design as determined by the student and his or her parent or guardian. And so again, I wonder how that is consistent with identifying, I have to say, both of my sons who were not remotely involved in gangs shaved their heads when they were in high school. Um, and I think that's a style that's very common to a lot of students and a lot of athletes. Um, that was why they did it. Um, so, again, I'm wondering how five is consistent with the notion that we have a fairly general comment about grooming habits and haircuts and any other attribute. I also um, wondered, the teachers and the parents that I have spoken to about the uh, dress code are much more concerned, to be quite honest, about with things other than the gang attire. They're, they're concerned about revealing clothing, about um, cl pants that seem to be almost falling off students, about um, bare midriffs, uh, clothing that doesn't have, it's not at all what we have been discussing, and yet when I talked to parents and, and teachers, that was the they were saying, I hope we get this dress code so we can start enforcing that. But my understanding was that was already part of the dress code. Um, oh, hey, so in, I'm sorry. So in addition, I'm just wondering where it says the following will not be permitted on the final page, number two, knee-high length socks when worn with long below the knee shorts. And then it says socks cannot be worn higher than mid-calf. I'm wondering if that applies to girls or only boys. We would have to clarify that this time it is the boys that we're referring to. I, I want to share with you a, a general comment that I don't think I've shared in previous meetings. It, the education code allows the banning of gang attire. However, the ed code specifies that if a district is going to do that, it must describe in a very specific manner what that gang clothing is. And that's what we've attempted to do here to define for the Santa Barbara School Districts what currently is gang attire. So again, I would continue with the questions about whether this applies to boy, both boys and girls. Um, what have, do we, have we identified the gang colors as being black, white, and blue? Um, no, we have not received uh, that direction from the uh, school resource officers. 
uh, that's be my answer. Because it also says gang that they will, gang colors will not be permitted. Right. So I'm, it what seems to me that we need to identify what those colors are. Well, the, the education code permits us to simply use that kind of language and consult with school resource officers uh, about the specifics. And in the end, that's what we'll end up doing. So we will have something that parents could read that would tell them what colors their students are not allowed After to wear? After we consult with school resource officers, yes. We're obligated to uh, make sure that there's wide distribution to these guidelines once they're approved by the board. Okay, and then seven seem to apply not to gang attire. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm assuming, I was, assu I was seeing it as much more generally directed at probably girls. Um, exposed midriff, low cut tops, short shorts, micro mini skirts, um, which I don't normally think of as gang attire. Um, and I wondered, because I thought in the past spaghetti straps had been an issue too, and that wasn't included. And so I wasn't sure if that was a change. Oh, excuse me. Um, it was oversight on my part. You may recall that it was not included in the first reading, but in the second reading, it was very specifically our elementary schools called for abandoning the spaghetti straps, and so I apologize. It should have been included in there. It should be included in number seven. Well, it was the former number eight. It Excuse used to be, me. It used to, it used to be a list of 14 instead of 13. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yes, spaghetti, spaghetti straps would be banned in our elementary schools. So I, I, I have to say I wasn't, I didn't realize that all of these were thought of as sort of gang attire. Um, with maybe the exception of seven, is seven the only one that isn't specifically directed at gang attire, or are are like is black? No, I don't like some of them. I don't know. Are black gloves considered actually, gang attire? Actually, if you take a look at two, three, five, nine, that references two, three, and five above, uh -huh. and thirteen, are uh -huh. often. And associated then, with gangs. And then the others aren't. The others are just Correct. general. Okay. Correct. That was something I wasn't clear about either. Okay. Thank you. Just, just a quick comment with regard to the, the dress code, and, and I've said it before. Um, I know that uh, other board members, including Ms. Cordero, have commented uh, on um, possible civil, civil liberties um, issues. And my biggest concern, concern still has to do with enforcement. I mean, many of these items are on our current list, and I think that schools still have difficulty with enforcement just because of numbers of students. Um, so uh, enforcement would be my focus. Let's not put anything on this list that we are not prepared to deal with on our campuses. And not prepared to deal with equitably and for all students. Well, yeah, I mean, I know that's exactly yeah, absolutely. what you mean. Absolutely, but that was the other point that I wanted to make um, was that I, I think it's important to point out that the con what the consequences are associated with the with any dress code. Um, in the previous section, we're talking about instances that lead to suspension and expulsion, and with dress code violations, we're talking about warnings, conferencing, um, perhaps making a student turn a t-shirt inside out or switch out a t-shirt, that kind of thing. If you had uh, potential consequences associated with the dress code policy, I think it would be extremely helpful. I will share with you in general that school administrators would view violations of the dress code, persistent violations of the dress code, as a violation of 48900K, i.e. defiance of school authority. Um, I'm just wondering, Mrs. Cadero, first of all, do you have a suggestion instead of the general haircut? If, if you have a suggestion, that would be helpful. But um, because clearly it's not the length that's the issue. It's, it's things, I, special well, things that are done to the hair. Yeah. Well, well we had talked about last, at the last meeting, it, certainly any, any you know, um, shaving of the insignia or or dying of the insignia or ho in it, whatever way um, students would present in their hair some sort of 
insignia or representation of gang affiliation um, would seem to be perfectly justifiable to 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 ban. Um, barring, in addition to that, however, um, beyond just very short hair, which I think is fine, maybe Mr. Smith would agree with me, <laughs> isn't necessarily <laughs> an indication of gang affiliation. Um, I was waiting for that. <laughs> would be, you know, what w I don't know what what uh, law enforcement or or school administrators identify as other hairstyles. That's why I was asking. What are other air hairstyles that are considered affiliation that would denote gang affiliation? Or, and is it only gang affiliation? I mean, if students wear a hairstyle that um, creates some sort of, you know, uproar in the classroom or that does something else, I, I mean, I'm, I, for, and believe me, I'm not advocating this mm -hmm. because I like the idea of students being able to uh, demonstrate their individuality, but I'm just wondering is it only, are we only talking about hairstyle as it relates to gangs or are there other kinds of hairstyle violations that students could have? At, at this time we're, we're not talking about banning uh, uh, hairstyles that may be unusual uh, f uh, for most of our comfort level. I will share with you in the past, however, uh, we have had youngsters who have chosen to cut their hair uh, very clearly in a manner that indicated, uh, for example, white supremacy. And these things would also be banned. Um, well, can, what I'm, well, I think what, what Ms. Parker and I were both trying to get at is what would that be? What would the hairstyle be? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know that I necessarily need to know the specific hairstyle. We just need some, a word that's a little bit narrower than haircut, but broader than one specific hairstyle. So I'm, d I'm looking for that language and I'm hoping that we can come up with that. My other suggestions would be specifically on number two, that we add boys to socks cannot be worn higher than mid-calf. Um, because so many of our students wear white t-shirts in combination with other shirts, I'm concerned about having that line in there at all. Um, and instead would suggest that admi if administrators can work with gang writing colors or emblems displayed on clothing, uh, that that might cover that um, as a suggestion. And then for um, number four, pants worn below the waist or oversized or sagging pants to clarify that with excessively oversized or sagging pants since there's lots of kids wearing baggy pants. Sorry to interrupt you, but wouldn't that also pertain to number three, excessively large, plain white t-shirts when worn in combination with another? I'm not sure, Mr. Gonzalez, is that the situation? I, I will share with you that as I was uh, following uh, Mrs. Parker's combination, I was actually talking about striking. I, I thought that you were moving to strike number three completely. Well, that's, but if you can tell me that the issue is not just that kids are wearing sh white shirts under colored shirts, but that they're wearing excessively large white shirts with. M my experience in walking around campuses, it's not just an issue of oversized white shirts, okay. no. Um, and then my question, the, the, the missing former number eight, which was for, um, spaghetti straps, tube, or halter tops. It actually, in the last one, I thought we had discussed that as being a K-6 recommendation, but it didn't, on the former, um, and in our last reading, it, re it didn't actually specify that it was K-6. I believe it, it said elementary, but yes, uh, K-6 would be accurate. Okay. So, uh, s suggesting that that get, I'm suggesting that that get added back in officially um, as maybe number 14 or renumbering it whenever we, however we deal with it. And those are my comments. How about the uh, public comments and the same one else? On the dress code? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, we have four public speakers on E1. It's Jennifer Archer, followed by Kate Moore, followed by Keith Terry. You'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30-second warning. So Jennifer Archer.
Hi, thank you. I'm here on behalf of the Teen Legal Clinic, and I want to comment both on guideline number seven on the disciplinary plan as well as the dress code. So I will be as quick as possible. With regard to the alcohol and drug guideline number seven, in response to Dr. Noel's comments, we would assert that punishment alone is antithetical to deterrence. Education and intervention promote deterrence. To the extent that the recommendation to table that for later is based on concerns that the assistant principals have voiced, we haven't heard what those concerns are. So certainly we need to know what they are so that we can address them. We think that our proposal has no downside. Um, a system of deterrence has no credibility unless there is also intervention, education, and rehabilitation. I agree with Dr. Sarvis that we need to promote a behavioral change, and I think that the United States Supreme Court and Roper v. Simmons, Dr. Sharkey, who submitted a letter to the board, and Judge Adams, who has practical experience dealing with juvenile uh, drug and alcohol issues on a daily basis would all agree. I would offer the services of the Teen Legal Clinic to participate in any type of study or focus group to discuss our position on those issues as you consider guideline number seven. With regard to the dress code issue, on behalf of the Teen Legal Clinic, we vehemently oppose the proposed dress code policy on the basis that it is not specific, it is, it is flawed and overbroad, and that the board should consider these issues with strict scrutiny. That these guidelines, to be enforced, could not possibly be gender or race neutral and we assert that they would invite discriminatory application. Totali totality of the circumstances is not a proper standard under which to determine whether kids are in violation and necessarily would invite discriminatory enforcement. It is not the kind of clothing when you talk to a child, you are not saying to them, this is the kind of clothing we don't enforce. What you are saying to them is it's the kind of clothing on you that we are not allowing. Youngsters who are gang, who are, thank you. Youngsters who are not gang members have short haircuts. Gang members have long haircuts and in between haircuts. That is not specific. If you want to be specific, then specifically delineate what you don't want to allow, such as gang tags in the haircuts. And with that, I'll conclude that we oppose the dress code policy as discriminatory and overbroad. Thank you. Okay, it's Kate Moore followed by Keith Terry. Sorry, I thought we had four, but we have three. Thank you. Um, I'm here also speaking about number seven and uh, about kids with drug and alcohol uh, offenses. Um, I'd like to say that there are a lot of really good kids who are making mistakes. Uh, this is quite common in the teenage years. Uh, I do believe they have to pay a very heavy price by being kicked out of school for a year. Um, just on a second offense, I, I think that that's very steep and too steep. Um, it's very painful, especially for kids who really love school and love learning. They're asked to go through a lot of um, rehabilitation. They go through many classes uh, with some, you know, very profound movies to show them the consequences of their, you know, offenses of drugs and alcohol. They have to do a lot of community service. They have to go through six months of counseling. It's a very long time and with many programs and many people helping them. And I do believe that it's, uh, you know, if they're willing to make this commitment of their valuable time to change, then I really hope that you can give them another chance to go back to their school of choice and not send them to a different school where they'd be starting all over again when they're 15, 16 years old. It's very hard to start with new people. I really believe they should be given another chance to go back to their school of choice. If they're willing to go through these changes and they've significantly changed their life, they've made the effort. Taking them away from a learning environment is painful for kids who really love to learn being out of school for a year is really painful and I just don't think that it needs to be prolonged and added injury to insult, you know, to send them to another school where they don't know anybody. I think they should be allowed to go to a school of choice, especially St. Marcus, which is the only school in town that has the block system, which for some kids is totally beneficial compared to the others. Um, the brain needs to be stimulated. You know, it's such a crucial time in the teenage years that 
to have them not getting an education um, is just not beneficial. You, you know, you're asking them to, what, be on the streets? You know, I think it's encouraging them by not allowing them to be in the classroom with good teachers who will really encourage them in the right direction. And uh, the suspension system, I, I really do hope that you take another look at it and put some valuable time in there, not just putting them in a little room where they learn nothing and get nothing at all. They get even hardly any books or homework. Um, that really needs to be you know, changed. Perhaps if they had counseling in that time, if they have a first offense for that first five days, I, you know, a lot of kids may not have ever a second or third offense. So um, I'm really hoping that you will give them more than two chances and I'm asking seconds. you to give them three chances if they have sincerely changed their life around. If you've looked at them and they've changed and they've become a really good, sincere person, I think they need to be rewarded. I don't think they need, you know, need to be rejected. What, what kind of message is that sending them? So please, case by case, these are really good kids. I'm seeing a lot of good kids and I really think they need another chance and, and please look at them and you know, really give them the chance to go back to their school of choice. Thank you. I'd like to clarify just briefly that if a student is subject to expulsion, we move them immediately into a program so that they're getting independent study um, as an educational program. And then when they are expelled, uh, that is true, they are expelled from our district, but we move them into a program, typically one operated by the county, uh, so that they're not without school. Um, and we finally have Keith Terry. Good evening. I spoke um, last meeting about this issue, item number seven, and about it being a two-strike rule and that even the state of California has a three-strike rule. But my colleague, I'm speaking on behalf of the Santa Barbara Teen Legal Clinic. Please excuse my voice. I'm just um, getting over laryngitis. My colleague um, from the Teen Legal Clinic, Jennifer Archer, made very valid points as far as item number seven, and I would like to, to read not reiterate, but to agree with her on those, adders, those matters, so I won't take up much more time. But I would like to touch on the fact that expelling students puts them on the street. And as we saw in one March day down on State Street, what it means when we have large amounts of students on the street. There, there needs to be some, some change in how we, how we address the first offense and how we address the second offense. There needs to be more intervention at the early stages, rather than, you know, you messed up once, twice, you're out. Because we don't effectively change the problem. Because all of those students that we expel or suspend, quite a few of them see it as a vacation. Some, yes, are devastated by the fact that they can no longer go to the school of their choice. But others, the ones who would be deemed really the problem students, are now out on the streets and they hang around all the high schools during lunchtime. So you don't remove the problem by just kicking them out of the schools. You'd have to remove them from the community. You'd have to remove them from their families. Well, I mean, what do we do next? We take them out of California, send them to another state? There needs to be something done with the students to help them integrate or reintegrate back into the society, the school society. I mean, it's easy to turn our backs and say, these are problem kids, let's get rid of them. There's somebody else's problem. But they will, they will always be our kids, whether or not we want to take responsibility for them or not, whether or not we want to provide them with the tools and the intervention that they can use to better themselves, to see a clearer path. So I really thank you on the time you're taking with this because I was under the impression it was going to be an open and shut thing, and it has not been. So thank you for taking the time to, to spend on this matter. And in my last 30 seconds, I'd like to speak about the dress code. Um, gosh, it's tough. It's a tough thing to say, if you dress a certain way, we won't let you in the school. Because it's not so much gang attire, it's, it's more urban attire. It's become a dress of young people. And how do we distinguish one from the other? Do we say if you have a short haircut and long jeans and long shorts and long socks, you're a gang member? It really needs to be looked at. And again, I thank you for taking the time to do that. Okay. Just, just one quick comment. I, I'm, maybe I'm being too sensitive. Um, 
but I, I just want community members to know how much board members agonize over expulsions. Um, I don't think that there's a single board member, and I will speak on behalf of all my board <laughs> members ahead. at this point, uh, my fellow board members, I, I, I don't think any of them thinks of these students as throwaways or getting rid of them. When we have a serious discussion about expelling a student and they're going to El Puente, we fully hope to have them back in one of our comprehensive high schools. That doesn't always happen, but it happens often enough. Um, so I, I don't want anyone to think that somehow we, we're thinking of throwing them away or dropping them out of our system or getting rid of them. Um, we agonize over these decisions and, and it's our hope that they would be, that they would receive the attention that they need at El Puente um, and come back to us, so. Thank you. Ms. Cordero, did you want to say something? I'm not sure where we are with this, and so I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm I know. don't know exactly <laughs> what to say. Um, I, I'm, I'm really concerned about the, the issue of the dress code. I think Mr. Terry uh, touched on it, um, that um, that is not just a gang style of dress. There are lots of young people in our community, but what makes it more troubling is that there are lots of young people in certain areas of our community who dress like this and not in other areas of the community who won't be affected by this dress code. Um, because essentially we are not implementing any additional uh, restrictions be because the dress code is essentially uh, for all non-gang related attire, the same as it has always been. So what we're essentially doing is implementing new restrictions on certain segments of our, of Santa Barbara young people, and they know that. They know that it's being placed on certain students and not others. Certain students will be able to come to school dressed as they always have been dressed, and the styles that are popular in their communities will not be questioned. Other students will have the styles that are popular in their communities, maybe even with their own families. Um, criminalized almost. Um, and that is my concern because students know that. I, I get the students at Santa Barbara City College who weren't successful in K-12, and they know when they have been targeted. Um, and we really, and I again wanna, wanna reference Mr. Terry, we really need to stop thinking of these young people as those kids and think of them as our kids. They are our kids, whether we like what they look like or not. And personally, you know, I grew up on the east side of Santa Barbara. I don't have a whole lot of objections to their, what they look like. Um, I have objections to what some of the young people in our community do, um, but they're still our community, they're still our young people, and we need to embrace them. We need to make them feel good about coming to school. I mean, part of the problem is that they feel disconnected to, to the academic environment. This, I don't see how they would feel more connected by this. This is just gonna make them feel even more targeted. Um, I, when I talked to Dr. Sarvis, you assured me, Dr. Sarvis, that any dress code policy that we would adopt would be uh, uh, enforced on all students. But when I hear that it's going to be in combination with behavior, that doesn't sound like enforcement on all, for all students. Um, so I'm passionate about this because I feel like you know, potentially my own family members could be targeted by this. Um, and so I think that we need to be a little bit more humane in how we're thinking about the young people in our, in our schools who are not feeling connected. And, you know, forgive me if I've repeated that too many times, but. Can we, can we then hold off on the dress code? And can I have a motion perhaps on the first part on the disciplinary action without you're gonna, seven? You're gonna feel like you're on the consent agenda. Can we remove yes. one, seven, 27, and 29 for the moment? One, 
7, 27, and 29 and move to approve and the clarify rest. 18 can we maybe. clarify 18 There's which was 18 that's the one that has that weird and or oh yeah 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 end. but i thought that mr what uh, gonzalez actually penciled that in so, so let's remove 18 just momentarily so okay. uh, a, mo mo a motion to approve all the other discipline guidelines can i ask uh the one more thing about did you want to keep the note on the note number one here the same yes mm -hmm. i do uh, are we are we approving the notes as well then yes mm -hmm. but which ones have you removed one. uh, not the notes the discipline guidelines one seven eighteen twenty seven and twenty nine no no just this one one then seven it's the road Yes. 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 Okay. Can I request that we also remove the notes so that we can vote on that separately? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. So. Uh, motion. What, what, what was Mrs. Cordero's request? I don't fully to remove the notes. To remove the notes so we can vote on those as a separate the item. The, the notes at the end. At the end. Yeah. The footnotes. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, okay. And passes 4 1. With regard to 7 and 29, we'll come back to them at a later date. Yes. Uh, with regard to number 18, if Mrs. Parker could simply read how she would like to have it corrected or Mrs. Cordero, mm -hmm. then we could vote on number 18 because it was really more a question of how it was worded, not the actual content. Um, not sure. So we originally it was harassment, threats, or intimidation against witnesses. Is that correct, Mr. Gonzalez? Uh, no, actually, no. It, it, yes, that is correct. We added including electronic transmissions mm -hmm. and or, correct. Okay. I would propose that it read harassment, threats, or intimidation, including via electronic transmissions, against witnesses I make a motion to approve number 18 without Sorry. wording it, it actually includes okay. witnesses I mean it, it'd be harassment of others threats against others and against can witnesses I, or witnesses can I suggest that we yeah. just stop after tr electronic transmissions because okay obviously it's against somebody Anybody? other than the person doing Whether it okay. they're a witness or <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. So the motion would be to approve number 18 with the wording harassment, threats, or intimidation, including via electronic transmissions. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, passes 5 0. Okay. And then with regard to. Can I, uh, make a motion on one and, and uh, 27? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Two. First offense column, uh, change, remove the word possible from number one. Do Dr. Noel, would you mind just doing one at a time here and just do one first and then 27 separately? Okay. Thank you. Fine. I, I, I amend my motion to adopt number one and remove the word possible in the offense column. Second. Can I, can I ask a question about what definitions of these are? Could battery or assault be something relatively minor or in order to meet the definition, does it have to be something fairly serious? I mean, if I, I there, remember we had a case where there, where there are degrees, there are degrees of each and it, it honestly, I mean, if you're talking about penal code and whether or not somebody presses charges, you actually have to have the victim willing to actually press charges. But there's a there's sort of a standard that any police officers actually need to go through. If I feel I've been assaulted with a variety of different things, because it may have. The, the, let me explain. It's, we had a no one. we had a couple of uh, recommended expulsions, where students had in one case a student had um, hit a teacher's hand while mm -hmm. trying to get to the phone, and there was a discussion of over whether the student had intentionally hit the teacher's hand or whether the student had accidentally hit the teacher's hand while reaching for the phone, et cetera. Right. Would that be, con could, could that possibly be considered assault or battery? 
assault battery battery is very serious okay battery so it is, could be right it, there's there's a, a repetitive nature to okay. of the assault uh, assault yeah i mean it could be considered by the victim to be assault again it's it, it's not how hard you were hit or if you were struck it's the fact that you were struck okay so <laughs> then that doesn't help yeah, so then I would like to renew my concern about removing the possible recommendation for expulsion because in the case where there's question over whether it was even intentional or not, um, I think that there should be some discretion over whether the, the case gets recommended for expulsion. Um, I, I think that in that case I would want it to come to an administrative hearing panel to make the call uh, before it comes to the board, obviously. Um, then why wouldn't it say possible recommendation? Because they, ha they, why they have that option. Well, this was why it, it does say possible recommendation, but I'm agreeing with Dr. Noel that it should just say recommendation. It, it doesn't, my, my proposal doesn't say expel unequivocally and without, without due process. It says recommend expulsion, which then puts it into a process involving an administrative hearing panel, involving uh, testimony, and ultimately a judgment to, by the panel to recommend expulsion, which the board doesn't have to accept. My concern is that when we recommend expulsion, it often becomes a fairly lengthy process before, the, before it's ever resolved whether the student is expelled or not. And when the student is, and the student remains suspended for that entire time, um, which often results in the student becoming um, behind in units, we do put them in, in uh, independent study, but often that independent study is only for an hour a day, um, and the students lose a lot of instructional time. And if it's a case that is fairly, I, I don't want to say minor, because you know, challenging in any uh, sort of insubordinate way an ins a teacher is not, ne is not minor, but it, if it's a case where it's likely that it would not result in, in uh, expulsion, then requiring it to be recommended um, seems like an undue lengthening of the process for the student. The student remains out of instruction for all that time. Well, out of full day instruction for all of that time. Well, it's the same thing is true about the sexual assault policy, uh, about the possession of a knife, uh, about the uh, robbery or and or extortion. Yes, but yeah. I'm not willing to equate touching somebody's and hand with sexual assault. In, in all of these cases, it says recommendation for expulsion without saying possible. So, I, so there's plenty of precedent here for that. And the due process, it seems to me, covers uh, uh, the con concerns for student rights for abuse of, okay. uh, abuse of the, of the uh, process in the first place. OK, so call the question. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, I think um, all those opposed. No. So it's four one. Okay. My second motion is on number twenty seven to use the language just adopted for number one. And I to remind you, uh, number twenty seven is upbraiding, insulting, or abusing a teacher. And uh, and my argument, of course, is the same. Oh, I don't have a second. I'll, I'll second just for the purpose of, of uh, yeah. letting it go forward. Uh, part, part of this comes from a, a, a shock that I, uh, you've heard me say this before, uh, a, a female teacher telling me that, uh, that she had been called bitch by a student. And I, that was such a, I, I'm not accustomed to that. Uh, and, uh, so I, I, and I, w I went back and checked a little bit more to see how commonplace that was. Was that a rare exception? And I did not, it wasn't, it wasn't common, but it was not uncommon, according to, these, to the source. And, uh, and the impact that has, uh, especially if it's a large male uh, that, that uses that kind of abusive language with the teacher, the impact on a female teacher uh, is pretty rough. Now, you know, I, wouldn't want to make a distinction sim strictly on gender lines. Uh, just I don't have any experience in anybody calling me a bastard when I was a teacher. But uh, uh, I suppose uh, 
it would have raised some dif difficult issues for me at that time, too. Okay. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Dr. Noel. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. 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 So it does not pass. Okay. Well, here is an alternative uh, oh. suggestion, and that is to uh, shift consequences forward so that on the first offense it includes the current list and possible removal from class under the second offense it includes all those uh, same consequences including possible recommendation for uh, ex uh, for involuntary transfer or expulsion just clarification because it says recommendation not possible recommendation uh, possible recommendation okay. And then under uh, additional offenses, uh, it would remain a uh, recommendation for involuntary transfer uh, or possible recommendation for expulsion. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? All those. Well, I, I, uh, mm -hmm. it is half a cake better than none? I, I, <laughs> uh, a fourth of a cake is better than none, and I'll support your motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 5 0. Now, on to the notes. I'm going to move to approve the notes. I don't know if I'll get a second. second. Okay. And, and with regard to the, the phone issue, once the picture is taken, once the phone is out at lunchtime and the pictures, the pictures are taken with the, uh, the camera on the phone, then it creates a whole new set of uh, disciplinary measures that have to be put into play rather than simply asking students to refrain from using their phones at lunchtime. I don't, I personally don't think that's unreasonable. Do I hear a second? I'm sorry, yeah, was there a, a Okay. Well, I just, again, want to focus on um, the, the sort of the rationale for things. And again, this is a case where it seems like one set of behaviors is being prohibited because another set of behaviors is considered um, problematic. And to me, that that doesn't seem logical. Um, and it also creates, again, I think M Ms. Harder raised previously the issue of enforcement. I think it creates an incredible enforcement problem in the in the it's, I mean it's during lunchtime I'm I'm certainly not advocating during time that uh, cell phones be allowed during the time that class is in session but during lunch period I can't imagine that we want to have teachers administrators etc walking around campus making sure that all cell phones are turned off um, and if we don't do that if students are are able to use their cell phones because it's not enforced then it becomes a meaningless rule um, and I I don't think it's appropriate to knowingly adopt meaningless rules I have to agree and uh, I think there are times at lunch when it's necessary to make a phone call for particular reasons but it doesn't exclude that possibility how so it where is the wording it, it says but it says in case of emergencies um, to me it's it actually beyond the f uh, photo issue it actually speaks to school climate as well and I think that we should be encouraging our students to interact with each other um, and if they need to make a phone call then they can go to the office and use their cell phone in the office but 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 seriously uh, Ms. Parker how does not allowing students to use their cell phone encourage them to interact with each other. If they want to sit under a tree and read a f book, I'm all for that. That's not interacting with other students, but I'm certainly not going to tell them they can't read. Um, you know, I think, I want them to interact with each other too, but I don't think prohibiting cell phone use is the way to promote that. Especially since sometimes they make a phone call to find another student to have lunch with, so. Um, because it's their high schools are rather large campuses and they don't always arrange it before the beginning of the day. I know my son does that occasionally. Anyways, call the question. question. All those in favor. Aye. 
All those opposed? No. No. Okay, I'm uh, sorry, it passes 3-2. Uh, Are we pretty much done then with that? And what do you want to do with the dress code is I'd rather just leave, I think we're behind enough right now, uh, and leave this for right now, come back to it. Okay. We're already an hour behind, so. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I'm sorry, but if yes. we. Do you want to give directions? Maybe well, we I want to know if we're going to come back to it in the ex exact same form as we did this time, or if we're going to give any direction for it to have any revisions to it. I, if I may share, it's very clear that we're to come back to you with a revision. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're on to <laughs> uh, approval of the facilities master plan implementation, Las Alturas, La Cuesta implementation plan. This item is driven by two primary needs. First and foremost is our obligation to provide the most effective program possible for our continuation students. Uh, we feel that that needs to be housed someplace appropriate and we feel the main floor of the Ortega campus is the is the right place for that and we think we can be it can be done safely and effectively there the second need is that we also have other space needs around the district uh, open alternative school for example has waited for years for additional space on its campus Santa Barbara High School we have additional needs at Santa Barbara High School for renovation and Dave Hatt Young can describe that in just a moment and as you will hear in a later report, uh, we would like to rent this part, the district office part of, of this facility, and we'd like to plan to do that a year from now. And we think we need additional space. We don't think we can squeeze into Santa Barbara Junior High in, in our totality here. We believe we need the downstairs part of the Ortega campus to house some of these programs so that it makes this facility available. Well, Paul Turnbull will give this report, and I know we have some staff members here as well. Paul. Thank you, Dr. Sarvis. The, um, as uh, Dr. Sarvis mentioned, we have Dave Hetyonk who will talk about the space issues both at Ortega and any particular uh, issues with moves from any site that we're talking about to here. Um, Gwen Phillips is here. Thank you, Gwen, for being here. She can talk about uh, OAS in particular and how the the vacated potentially vacated space would be used on the La Colina campus and Mark Caprito is here for two purposes um, he can answer any question about the uh, the need first of all of space on the Santa Barbara High School campus remember we're talking about the lower campus uh, on Ken and Perdido and uh, he can also talk about the use of a potential or a pilot bridge program if a move is made by uh, the direct instruction classrooms. So to bring you up to speed, we're talking about the potential for, uh, in 0809, a move of two Los Alturas direct instruction classrooms from the La Colina campus to Ortega. And we're talking about two direct instruction classes from Santa Barbara La Cuesta, Santa Barbara High School, excuse me, La Cuesta, to Ortega. Um, when you originally had the report, we were talking about a phased in approach. It's important to recognize we're talking about the school year 2008, 2009, one phase only. Any subsequent phase would require both a report to the board and approval by the board. We're not talking about tonight you giving sweeping, rec or sweeping approval for the, the whole program per se. Um, Kathy Abney and her staff are here. They've done an outstanding job, not only of putting together a program that makes sense, but also is, is viable in phases. And I have to uh, thank Kathy for not only her, her ongoing passion and commitment to all of this, but her patience. She's, she's got stick to -itiveness. <laughs> So um, without further ado, I would ask Kathy to come up. We have a PowerPoint available and ready. And I think the best way to go about this is for you to receive the report from Kathy and her staff in its entirety and then um, just understand that the other individuals I mentioned are available for comment or question. And I just have my whole staff here. 
have come up here. In case you have any questions of any of them, I'm going to introduce them to you really quickly. Hey, I'm going to have the staff. You guys can go ahead and sit down if you'd like to, but I'm going to just introduce everybody to you in case you have questions at the end. There'll just be three of us actually speaking, and we're going to make this short and sweet because a lot of this you've actually heard. So as soon as everybody gets seated, there's some pretty amazing people here. Thank you. Tell me again how this works. Forward and back. Got it. I can handle that. Forward and back. Okay. So if we start in this row here, Kelly Bayesa, teacher. Mitch Tarina, counselor. Tony Rincon, community outreach coordinator, does our truancy work. Charnel Mora, teacher. Alejandra Aronovich, psychologist. Matt McCaffrey, resource specialist. David Delgadillo, teacher. Norma Lule, teacher. Uh, Deborah Teton, counselor. Behind her, Dominic Frecking, teacher. Re Regina Frecking, teacher. Nancy Stevens, teacher. Julie Crandall, teacher. And Paul Cronshaw, teacher. So. Um, Pretty, pretty um, powerful brain trust we got going here. Um, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Some of this you've seen before, so I don't want to bore you. You know what our goals are. You know what we'd like to do. You have copies of the PowerPoint. I think the important thing is to realize that we, we really are on board with doing this slowly and in a really um, you know, a refined manner so that it, it's done right. Um, providing students with a rich educational experience is important. Uh, we also are looking for strong school community partnerships that we can continue growing. Um, the vision, you know, you know what we want to do. I think one of the most important things, and we talked about this seven years ago when I became principal, was becoming WASC accredited. And every single year when I look at it, there is just no way, the way, you know, with two teachers delivering direct instruction, that we can honestly say to a WASC accrediting committee, here we are, and we're doing everything we need to do, and we've got the data to prove it. So that's one step forward, and, and my hope is that in our first year, we can get that preliminary and start this process. Um, this you've, you've seen also, master schedule, increased course offerings. We've got a beautiful master schedule. Um, school culture based on tenets of tolerance and acceptance, increased efficiency in the delivery of services. I think this is important, opportunities and leadership for our students to help coordinate activities, plan field trips, um, talk about what they want to do. We're talking about doing field trips for the whole school, field trips for perfect attendance, field trips for good, you know, good behavior, credit earning, and, and letting kids really you know, kind of step up and take leadership roles. Um, access to the community. Um, and the bottom, the bottom bullet is, is a new one, and that would be the pilot bridge program at Santa Barbara High School during the 08-09 school year. And look at this. Isn't this pretty? Kelly Baeza. Um, so here is a tentative master schedule that we put together. So some of the differences from uh, what's currently happening at the La Cuestas, we don't, we as teachers don't get a prep period. Um, we start our day at 7.30, students leave at one-ish, some of them hang around for a while, and that begins our duty-free, you know, lunch and prep period. So um, consolidating some sites would allow for common teacher prep periods happening before school um, would also allow for collaboration of teachers. Um, so this would repre represent four different teachers and then all the, also all the uh, other staff. So that would occur um, before school. The 9 to 930 would be a personal development uh, course advisory where the teachers would be mentoring a certain number of students that they would meet every day. Um, we currently have a curriculum that was developed um, that we're enjoying and students seem to be getting a lot out of. Then a 9.30 to 11 o'clock block, and so there would be four classes offered at each block. What is really amazing is that currently we teach English. We have 10th, 11th, and 12th graders in there at all different levels, and we have to kind of pick and choose the standards and try to balance it out and try to differentiate. This would allow us to have a 910 English and an 1112 English, and the same goes with, um, with mathematics and also history. So we would be having life science 
Currently, right now, I have a lot of students that are taking life science as their elective. They have already passed life science, um, so this would allow them to take a course that they need instead of having to repeat something as an elective unit. A short lunch, and then the end of the day, we'd have a one hour period of either PE or art, and then our community programs. And they might not be doing yoga every single day. It can vary depending on whether the, what days the community programs come. Um, and then Friday is kind of a special day. We have our AVID workshops. That would be a, give our students a chance to either make up some of the work that they missed during the week, um, develop mastery of certain standards if they haven't achieved mastery, and then also have opportunity for enrichment classes if they were caught up. Oh, we we all the the difference between this is spring. The the main difference is that we were offering econ for our seniors in the fall and government in the spring. Um, the beauty of it is we could change uh, courses depending on our students' needs. And uh, da, 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 I think that's that. One of the um, beauties of alternative ed and working at LaCuesta is we really do get to know our students and and they are very connected with us and we are the adults in their lives that hopefully are being a positive influence. Um, we really, as alternative ed teachers, look for the positive in our students. We're not looking for the negative, so we're trying to find all the things that they do right. Um, typically, their traditional high school doesn't necessarily offer that opportunity. Uh, we like to honor them and encourage them to be uh, to be leaders, and also um, being teacher advisors. And now, Mitch. And that picture right there, tell them what class uh, That is uh, one of the San Marcos La Cuesta students. Uh, Dr. Cronshaw came and gave a presentation on bees. And Marco decided to that he would demonstrate w using the full gear and smoking out the bees or making them what I don't know. <laughs> so, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to create an environment for our students to be successful. And the idea is this first part where we have teacher advisors. Right now with two teachers on each campus, it's really hard for some of our teachers to, to wrap their head around the idea that a student who's continually been unsuccessful in a previous school and then come to our, our, our program and initially find the same lack of success to find out what parameters and what areas of their school career we need to change for them. With four teachers plus uh, the counselor support plus our community out outreach support, we actually have five, six, maybe seven heads of educators around to discuss one student and the possibilities of where that student can be successful and how to bring those resources to that student. The other part uh, for that we're going to support with our students is this 40 assets model, and I believe it's attachment D in the handout. And I was scanning through that. Um, a lot of our students don't have assets, external or internal. And to provide a program, to provide a school, which what I highlighted, close to half of these could be provided by a school program. Uh, something as simple as another adult relationship or something more specifically as safety. Sometimes our school is the safest place for them to be, out of the neighborhood, sometimes out of their family environment. Also, uh, having a certain equality and social justice be presented to them and modeled to them in a school system so that they go out into the world knowing that that's an expectation and actually a right that they should have. So I've gone over this before regarding the support and safety in the program. Right now, as a counselor, I have to travel to four different sites. And in the time of right before graduation, uh, even though I've been to every site every week for the last four or five weeks, now all of a sudden the seniors are very concerned about where they are. And so um, if I had access to those students all the time, they could just drop in on me and say, hey, look, I don't know where I'm at credit-wise, where, where I need to be. 
Now they have to wait a week in order to get that information. They can sum some of that information up with the teachers. A lot of times the teachers don't have the time or the specificity as far as re in regards to specific subjects and credits in those subjects. Um, so having a special education staff, again, on board, on site, to, access, to have those students access that as far as their IEP goes. Um, outside agencies and consistent expectations from one site and, and across board, having all of our teachers aligned as far as expectations. And then again, uh, safety as far as our intakes, uh, the screening process that we go through, having staff vigilance uh, across the board in all of one site where we can walk down the hall and see who's out and who's not, who's not in classroom. And then the uh, access to the east-west sides uh, via the shuttles that are running through and already are current, currently going through uh, the city. Mitch, do you want to explain gang, uh, oh gosh, what was it, gang representation disclaimer? So part of what the, our intake would be would be really to ask that student if they are gang affiliated. And most of them in a one-on-one -on -one or just with their parents will, will very candidly say yes or no. They will admit it or not. Part of the disclaimer will be can they come to our school and not represent? Can they be in a setting where we're going to focus on academics and focus on their success and have those four walls be a neutral zone? And they either will or won't. And so students will know coming into that school, to our school, our students will know it's neutral and we're going to keep it that way. And so part of that gang representation disclaimer is really putting that on the table. And with all the resources that we have with uh, our resource officers, we have a lot of information prior to them coming to us. So this is not a question I ask everybody. It's a question who those who are specifically or have claimed to be affiliated. So community resources, one of the few things that we really want, one of the few things that I see students, our students having availability is, is this. Uh, the Wilderness Youth Project, we had a great relationship with them and they actually took three of our sites and they worked with the students on survival skills. We made fire and we did a lot of other really neat things. Doesn't sound neat, but they actually went on this survival <laughs> thing. They did a, they called a, a, a solo, was it called solo? So they took students and they said, okay, you're going to go out in this area where all you have is some water and a sleeping bag. And you're going to be able to face yourself over the next 24 hours. And of course, there was this idea of safety. If you, if you really needed to come in and really kind of freaking out out there, you could. But the idea was to challenge yourself and the thoughts of yourself and, and get away from the noise and the environment of, church, of your, your home and of the city and of your peers and really think about what you are and who you want to be. And that, that program worked really well. One of the hard parts about it was they, that group had to travel to four different sites to, to stimulate and get enough students working that project. Uh, we have Tapas Project working now, students doing yoga, um, which I think is always very good as far as mastering a certain peace of mind and a steadiness and, and a calmness. Uh, YMCA Empowering Youth, we have students who actually use the YMCA for, for fitness. Um, CADA, you know about. The Youth Center Media Project, which seemed to get a lot of press uh, the last few months. I, I don't know if they mentioned that the majority of those students were actually La Cuesta students, so that might be something that, to, to keep in mind to have that project just on one site. Uh, Just Communities, we've worked in car partnership um, over the last four or five years and really talking about pieces of equity and um, the educational process and how the students can engage in that process to make it better for them specifically. And then the other uh, partnerships we have is the Museum of Museum of Art Collaborative and Tina Villaloid who comes through because we don't have art teachers, certified art teachers or certificated, so we have programs come in to do that work. And then UCSB Partnership Training, uh, our resource teacher, Mr. McCaffrey, has used students from UCSB to come and tutor some of our students currently. Kathy. So, so to wrap it up with our professional dedicated staff members and by getting consolidation of campuses, we can achieve WASC accreditation, huge dream. Model continuation high school status. I want this school to be the gem of the Central Coast and of California. I want this district to be proud of this, this school that we're creating. An exemplary independent study program status. Last year was the first year that the State Department of Ed named independent study programs into exemplary program status. We want to be one of those too. And most importantly, we believe that La Cuesta High School can provide an improved academic, social, and personal success for all of our students. 
Our students and our staff are eagerly anticipating the opportunities and the benefits that can be provided on a consolidated campus. So we are open to any questions that you might have and they're all here. Uh, I just have a quick question. What's the, what advantage does the WASC accreditation get you? Um, if a diploma or if a school is not WASC accredited, any school that the student transfers to does not have to accept the credits on that student's transcript. So one of the reason that our middle college students are, are graduating from their traditional high schools, their home high schools, is because they're going on to four-year colleges and universities in many cases. We don't have an accredited diploma. And so, because we're not WASC accredited, um, so one of the huge advantages is that if, if my students transfer to a school in Ventura, Ventura does not have to accept their credits. Now that hasn't become an issue ever, but it could become an issue at some point. So, and I would like to be in the position one of these days of being able to take credit for all those middle college students and get to claim them as my graduates. So um, that's another advantage of being accredited is, is you know, to have a fully um, accredited credential or um, diploma that allows kids then to go on to four-year colleges and universities and have that be seen. It has the A through G requirements. It has, you know, all of the things that, that all the bells and whistles. Um, I certainly have questions about this program, but I'm not sure if now is the time to take them. Yes? No, I don't. And then we have a speaker. Questions. Okay. What do you think? I, well, I'd like to hear the public speaker, but also so much of this hinges on item F1 as well. Right. So should we hear F1 first? Right. Okay. But let's go ahead and take the E2. I thought you had questions for her. I do, but maybe it should all be integrated together um, as the whole package. Um, Keith Terry is our speaker on E2. Good evening. <clears throat> I guess you're starting to get to know me, huh? Well, again, uh, thank you for allowing me the time to speak on this matter. I've been working with the La Cuesta school system for close to seven years now, and now I speak as a representative of Why Strive for Youth, Inc. Um, if you haven't heard of us and you look in the Daily Sound, and I have copies if you need them, we're, we're mentioned in there today. Um, all of the items that were put in the PowerPoint, I, to see them in a PowerPoint and to hear them from educators, I guess has a lot of power. But to hear them from a community organization that has had a terrible time keeping up with four campuses. Um, we, we are using so much of our resources and traveling from point to point, and with fuel being at the price that it is, and I don't have to go into that, um, a small organization such as ours finds it very difficult to work on all four campuses. So we, we have had to limit our services to only two of the four campuses at a time, um, meaning that students that could be receiving free services from us can't get them because we can't get to them. Um, another thing that it would help is it would break down a lot of the lines that we break down during our retreat, as mentioned here in the paper. Um, those, those students who would like to come and be a part of our retreats are kept separate all year long. So once or twice a year, we get them together and it's something new. The consolidation of La Cuesta to one campus or consolidating the two campuses or something that brings the students together would be beneficial. It would automatically break down some of those community lines because the students would be in a neutral area where they would get to know each other, where they would see each other on a daily basis. Um, there are quite a few items that I, I would like to have gone through the PowerPoint, but you know, I, I know we're short on time. But um, there, there are areas where we could increase our efficiency and deliver of services. Um, areas where we could increase our community service and mentoring opportunities, increase the community resources, um, field trips, opportunities. Whenever we go on a field trip, take La Cuesta students, we have to pick up in two or three locations, um, two or three different vehicles. It just cost us so much to deliver service to our primary target of students that um, anything you could do to help this to help consolidate this matter would be beneficial. 28 minutes. Um, seconds. <laughs> <laughs> seconds, I'm sorry. Um, but um, I just, just want to conclude in saying that I've worked with this staff 
these these teachers, and they're like no other teachers in any other school district or any other school that I've worked with. The dedication and the amount of time and effort they put into these students, it, it kind of goes unnoticed at four different sites. So thank you for allowing me the time to speak again. If no one has any comments about this at this point, then we'll go on and we'll come back to this. Okay. So. Oh, question. Oh. Uh, how many students are in La Costa? In the four direct instruction sites, approximately 150. We're talking about moving up to 80 students and four teachers. And how many teachers uh, total? I've in the, we have eight direct instruction teachers, six independent study teachers. And the independent study teachers have about another 150 students. Wow. And they, they meet them, what, once a week? It depends on the program. Um, independent study up at middle college, they meet once a week, and then those students also take college courses. Independent study on the Santa Barbara campus, they meet with the teacher an hour a week, and then they do four hours a week of study hall, where they have access to computers and, and just some FaceTime with other students. And for the direct instruction on campus, uh, what's the average class size? Average class size is 20 to 1. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item F1. Mm -hmm. Well, item F1 is a report on feasibility of moving the district <coughs> office and rental of the district office site and report on the feasibility of rental of the Ortega Street school site. This is uh, placed by a board request on the agenda, and we can share our current thinking about uh, both of these sites, and this allows the board an opportunity to discuss it. Dave? Dave Hetjunk is our Director of Facilities and Maintenance. What are we looking it, at? It's a complicated puzzle, so I'll oh, start I with see. Santa Barbara Junior High School. <laughs> I see. Very good. Okay. And you might want to keep in mind some square footage, uh, square footages. Let me get my pointer here. I'm about to give you. The shaded area in here is the area that the district office used to occupy at Santa Barbara Junior High School. Um, this area right here, this 4495 square feet, was occupied by the business office. It would be uh, everybody uh, except facilities and the people located next door that are under the business division. The area right here was occupied by a uh, superintendent and assistant superintendents. This was a board conference room. The board used the Globe Theater for board meetings. All this is so I'm told. I wasn't here then. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this area right here was used by personnel, and it was also labeled special services. I'm not sure what special services was, but there was also a gate office in here. And whether, whether it was a student services, some special ed, some combination of that. Currently, this portable houses IT functions. Uh, this portable unit house child development. And in this area, we have programs of Healthy Start, AOK, -okay, District Nurses, and CalSOAP. So if the district office was to move in here, these people and child development would all need to move out to some other location, such as the basement of the academy. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so if you take this square footage right here, 17,066, this portable right here is approximately 2,500 square feet. This is our current district office. We currently occupy 26,000 square feet. So in addition to the area at Santa Barbara Junior High, we're about 7,000 square feet short. At Santa Barbara Junior High, there were no conference rooms like we have the luxury of having here for trainings and things. 
Some of those things may have to be at other sites. Uh, we would also have to look at maybe another 5,000 square feet of housing other programs. If the uh, board did move La Cuesta in, one possibility would be to move current people from Santa Barbara Junior High and part of the district office into classrooms at that site. I don't know how many. We haven't studied exactly how much room that would take, but we would, and that would free up this building uh, for lease. Another thing to consider, When you look at Santa Barbara Community Academy, these three rooms here are now part of the district office and need to remain so unless we want to spend about a hundred plus thousand dollars in making an accessible path with a wheelchair lift between the two buildings. When the academy moved out, this requirement went away. And, and so if you were going to lease a building of the, of the uh, academy, you would consider this area, which would be uh, these four classrooms in the basement, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the upper floor. So basically, this square footage would transfer, this square footage here, I think it's about uh, 2,750 square feet, would transfer from the academy to the square footage of this building if this building was rented. Dr. Noel, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. And, and ask a question. Uh, Excuse uh, me, Mr. I'm trying to I remember, all, I remember everything you said so far okay. uh, because I was there. <laughs> but what I don't remember is what, whether there's a second floor that was used uh, above the uh, part that you said personnel was in. I, I have no record of, of, of using Santa Barbara Junior High. Yeah. There are apparently you're, you're offices in the tower at one point yeah. on the third floor, but uh, only a couple. Yeah. There's yeah. not much room up there. There was nothing on the second floor above the personnel? Office. I understand that there was not, no, yeah. no. And, and those, t the wing and, well, the two wings are actually, no, they're, they're limited. There was nothing on the second floor. And I met with John Becchio as recent as this afternoon as far as for the 09-10 school year, what do things look like? And for the 09-10 school year, it looks like Santa Barbara Junior High can give up this shaded space that was used previously. So the so basically becomes if we have this space available for district office, if we have maybe say the four basement rooms of the academy available for the district office, we would still be short between five and seven thousand square feet if we were going to function as we are today. Uh, one piece of the puzzle may be that if you decided to move uh, La Cuesta and programs to the academy, as they vacated other secondary sites, other secondary sites would be available for satellite functions of the district office. We've not had a discussion in cabinet yet with Dr. Sarvis and his deputy superintendents and assistant superintendents as to who is critical to be at the district office for those functions and who could be out in a satellite position. I noticed that in this previous diagram, there was no director of facilities. There was no director of compliance. Uh, there, there, there was not a, a, a research and development at one time was out in this portable, uh, which, which they could possibly move back into being across from IT if child development looked out. So it, it's really a puzzle as to board priorities um, as, as to what they would be, as to what your priority is for La Cuesta, what your priority is for, for vacating this office to create revenue. Uh, what Mr. Smith is going to tell us about the viability of leasing the district office uh, or the academy, uh, or what I, what I refer to now as the Ortega campus, excuse me, not the academy, but it, uh, it gets complicated and, and these are the square footage we've looked at as far as what we occupy, what would it take, how would we change how our function, 
one thing's for sure that if we moved, a lot of our district trainings that we have here at this site would, would have to be held in schools uh, at hopefully uh, a conference room, a, a library, a, uh, a, a theater, some, some place that would hold a large gallery, gathering because we would not have that space available. Uh, the boardroom here, uh, I'm not sure how many people we could hold there. Probably we could hold most of our meetings there, but some may have to be moved to other places when we expect a larger crowd. In 1997, there was the largest board meeting, I think, in history, about 750 members of the public. But it was held at Cobra. No, held in the auditorium there. Oh, in this auditorium, yes. But it was held in what's now the, the Marjorie, Marjorie Loop Theater. Marjorie yes. Loop Theater. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at that time, though, there were other mm -hmm. functions on other campuses. I mean, if I recall correctly, right. I want to say Harding had some IT functions on their campus. Right. Um, and there were some other right. odd dispersals. Yeah. And, and you, have, you have people that are here in the basement, too, independent study, home hospital, uh, uh, and like I say, we haven't had discussion yet with, with the superintendent or, 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 or deputy superintendents or assistant superintendents as, as to what functions would be critical and which people could be housed in a satellite location. I can tell you that at the elementary sites, I know of no vacant classrooms. Uh, if I did know of vacant classrooms, I would propose to you that we move them to either Cesar Chavez or Peabody Charter to get rid of portables that we're leasing. Uh, if we vacated some classrooms at the secondary site, we're also leasing right now five cl classrooms at San Marcos High School and three at Santa Barbara High School for overcrowding. We've made contact with those principals of those two sites and we're looking at, based on actions that the board took as far as class size reduction and utilization, can any of those portables next year be returned uh, to the vendor that we're leasing them from? Basically, we lease those classrooms because even with rotating teachers, we ran out of space. I have I have one puzzlement. Uh, when did we? When did the uh, district office leave there? I came to the district in summer of early summer of 2000, and at that, and at that time we were housed here. So I. I'm, I think it was a year or so before that, that the district office moved from Santa Barbara yeah, Junior like High back to the site. Yeah. 1999? Yeah. yeah. Uh, since 1999, I mean, uh, 1999 was, a, my recollection, a period of very high enrollment in this district. And uh, now it's, enrollment's gone down a lot, and yet the demand for administrative office space seems to be much higher. Uh, that, I don't expect an answer, but that is a puzzlement to me. Because well, at the same time, when I say, yeah. when I, on, in other contexts, I have raised the question, well, haven't we, aren't we bigger now administratively than we used to be? And the answer is, all, oh, no, no, well, never. I don't well, know isn't what, the Lacumber site, didn't that also well, I, have? I, I don't know about number-wise. I, I do know that, that, uh, that from what I'm told, we store a lot more than we used to, and we have a lot more conference space than we used to. But, but as far as the actual numbers, I, I can't comment on those. I, I wasn't here then. Didn't La Cumbra campus also have a large um, office space for the OAAOK program and all these programs that are now uh, here? So, some of these programs were housed in eight portable classrooms at the La Cumbra campus, which, which we, were demolished. So we did not have to spend an exorbitant amount of funds retrofitting those and making them accessible. Um, I have a question about, maybe this is for Mr. Smith, is about the demand for office space and how likely it is that we would actually be able to rent this out. That would be Mr. Smith's portion, yes. <laughs> I'm going to focus my comments primarily on what Dave refers to as the Ortega site because it's vacant and then maybe we can draw some conclusions about that and extrapolate and uh, apply them toward the district office. One of the things we did today was we, uh, Dave and I, met with uh, representatives from a commercial real estate uh, firm to actually do a walkthrough of the Ortega site. Given that it's vacant and given that we have an opportunity to do something with it, we wanted to see how viable, um, not only in terms of revenue generation possibilities, but the lead time to do such. I can tell you that this publication that we get quarterly from Pacifica Commercial Real Estate identifies what the commercial real estate rates are, lease rates are for downtown Santa Barbara. Um, they've dropped in the last quarter to 
$2.54 per square feet in terms of the most ideal lease rate. Now I'm gonna tell you why, all the reasons that we can't lease the Ortega site for that. When I approached the two representatives um, from Pacifica that did a walkthrough of Ortega with us today, th the questions I had were one, what could we lease this for and what would be the time frame in terms of marketing? So after we did a pretty extensive walkthrough of the 17,000 square feet that's allocated to the Ortega site of the property, here were their comments. Their comments were that if you had an educational institution, whether it was a college, a university, private school, and you had to do no modifications whatsoever, you probably could rent it at about $1.97 per square feet. Okay, so that equivalates to about a $401,000 annual income stream. Say the re that again, how much? $1.97 per square feet times 12 times 17,000 square feet. So it, it ends up being about 401,000 annualized if you had that kind of end user. And the reasons that that is different than the current market rate were threefold. One, the existing improvements are not traditional office, they're classrooms, okay? Two, 17,000 square feet is relatively large, and even though it seems counterintuitive, the larger the space, the lower the per square foot amount in terms of its marketability. And three, approximately 38% of the space is basement and therefore cannot command the same rent as above the ground space. So there's a devaluation there as well. So that is if you had the ideal tenant, somebody that moved in, had no improvements they had to do, could basically go turnkey. Th that's not likely. I mean, it's within the realm of possibilities, but it's not likely. If there had to be improvements to convert to a professional office, it gets more problematic. Not only do you have about six months of marketing time, you probably have six months in terms of capital improvement time. And given the capital improvements that needed to be made, you probably have to amortize about 20 months worth of lease payments over, let's say, it'd probably a 10-year lease stream. So you'd give up about 20 months of free rent, and then your market rate or your lease rate goes down to about a dollar and 44 cents per square feet, which is roughly about $300,000. So, if you had a tenant that basically was going to bear the brunt of doing capital improvements to basically convert those classrooms back into office. You're looking at about $1.44 per square foot. If you had an institution that could use it as is, you're looking at about, what did I just say, uh, $1.97 per square feet. So the difference is between about three hundred dollars and $400,000 square feet. In any event, you'd have to convene a 7-Eleven committee for the Ortega site as well as this site after I conferred with Craig Price today, unless this site had joint occupancy after we leased it out. There, there's a loophole there. But with respect to the Ortega site, we would have to have a 7-Eleven committee, so you're looking at probably at least six months to convene, go through that process. Another six months of marketing, if you get an end user that can use it as is, you'd be in there in 12, 14 months. If you have to have the capital improvements done and have that amortized in the lease, you're looking at about an 18-month timeline, and that's your most optimal. So that's what we're dealing with with respect to the Ortega site. We haven't really refined the numbers on the district office side, but since there's office space already, and because not as much of it is underground, I think it'll be a much more competitive. I don't think it'll reach the $2.54, but it's probably going to be above $2.00. But obviously, not only is the district office occupied, as you can see, we've got an issue with space in terms of relocation to the junior high and a number of other issues that would have to be ferreted out before we could go down that. So we still have a lot of due diligence to do in that regard. But I just thought the board should have that information relative to this decision. Um, I want to thank Pacifica for coming over here in such short notice and being willing to walk through and give us their thoughts. And I'd be happy to a answer any questions you might have. How many square feet are in this section? 
About 26,000, is that so, correct, Dave? So 26,000 times, just so we have a ball, uh, times the dollar fifty it's, a square foot. Well, that would be higher because here you wouldn't have to do the capital improvements because you have office space and not as much as underground. So you're probably looking somewhere over $2 is what I'd, my guess would be on the district office side. Th these slides do not represent the classrooms 12, 13, and library area that used to belong to the academy that's now for ADA purposes considered part of this office. So when you see this slide, you add about 2,700 square feet. And when you see the academy slide, you subtract about 2,700 square feet. Um, let, let me be specific. Uh, the district office would be 29,512 square feet. And the Ortega campus would be 17,570. So, so 29,512 times around $2, you said? Yeah, well, part of that's the basement. So, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to. Well, oh. you remember when I was looking at the other rate is $1.97, and that's 38% of the Ortega side is basement, and that was the figure without the capital improvements being advertised. So, I think right. you'd be above $2 right. given the percentage. So if you took two dollars times twenty six thousand times twelve, what is that? Yeah, I don't know if you get two dollars a square foot for our basement, is is what I'm saying. Yeah, but I'm saying it's it's a yeah. proportional distribution, right. you know. So like <laughs> three quarters of it might be two dollars and ten cents, gotcha. and the other is a dollar ninety nine gotcha. or whatever. <laughs> so. Um, so in terms of moving the district office back to Santa Barbara Junior High School, it may be possible. I mean, this is just, and to me, there's so many questions about future enrollment because we're doing this with an, an, an enrollment decline right now um, that will uh, no doubt stabilize at some point in the future and um, may go up again. Um, but it could be possible, possible but it would be complicated. Um, it seems to me that it would be a lot simpler simply to combine La Cuesta, Santa Barbara High, and Las Alturas at the Santa Barbara Junior High site, that that would be an easier puzzle to put together. Um, but th there are certainly ramifications to that also. So um, I'll throw that out for discussion. C can I just one point of information? Anytime you convene a 7-Eleven committee, one of their primary charges is to look at the demographics of the specific you know surplus facility they're looking at to see to answer exactly those type of questions in terms of enrollment projection will that space be needed again as a school facility sometime you know in the long range future and so that's supposed to factor in their decision whether they make a recommendation to the board to declare something surplus or not i i oh go ahead um well wh why don't you go ahead because i had a question about our process um, I just have to say that of, all, I mean, obviously there are lots of different configurations we could come up with, and obviously I may not be around to make any of those decisions, but I would be really opposed up front to putting La Cuesta on the Santa Barbara Junior High campus. Um, we have a number of programs on our various junior high campuses, um, but I think it would be a, a goal, an objective, to get high school students off of a junior high campus. So I just want to throw that out there. Uh, I had a concern uh, that um, that the way we have our items agendized, we have a recommendation to approve the move for La Cuesta, but we have um, the district office issue on the, con on the conference agenda. Um, and I would, I would not want to see us take action on that from the conference agenda, given that I think there, it's possible there would be people here to speak to if it had been on the action agenda. Yeah, no, it wasn't my intention. And I don't see how we can act on E2 before we have acted on F1, or with, with, with F1 up in, up in the air. Um, and so I'm concerned about how we have these agendized. Be I, well, I guess I'm concerned that I, I'm not sure we're going to be in a position to be able to act on E2. 
Well, it would be possible if we eliminate certain possibilities. We may want to go ahead with the idea of moving the district office over, but it's not something we're going to decide on tonight. That's, that's agreed on. The question is whether if we want to take or take a street off of this, then we can go ahead and vote on, uh, F2, on E2. Well, that's the same as that's what just what well, the, there's two separate the things. Just said, then you'd be essentially voting on the conference agenda on the Ortega issue. Taking it off, does that not mean a vote? You can't act without a vote. It would take it out of play, but I, th I mean, I do think that when you just look from a square footage point of view, if we want to continue to investigate renting out either property, the district offices have to be moved. They can't make up the square footage at Santa Barbara Junior High alone. They would need part of the Ortega site. If you put the function in the basement of the Ortega site, you've got a single level that is less desirable than the district office's side of the property. So we could continue to pursue the option of looking at renting out the district property, but proceed with Ortega, given the fact that there's no way to move the district offices out of this site without giving up some space, quite likely, at the Ortega site already. I, I tend to agree with Mrs. Cordero, uh, and and, and uh, there's some, it seems to me we need to look at a whole picture here more comprehensively, and we haven't had a, a full discussion of some of these possibilities with uh, Mr. Hedgong. The, the parameters he's given us, are, that's all new information uh, tonight, and I, I, uh, I'd like to have a chance to reflect on that a little bit. Uh, I just, I think it'd be premature to to take action on the uh, what's the, uh, the agenda item uh, E2. on on E two uh, independently uh, from uh, prior consideration and, pi pi and prior action on or joint action on uh, <coughs> oh it's F one. Ms. Parker, do you want to say something? Well, I just would like a clarification, Dr. Noel, because whichever we do, uh, whichever way we'd move, move forward, we need to do a 7-Eleven committee. There would not be any final, it could be months before there's any final decision on renting out anything. And I hate to wait um, in terms of getting Los Alturas and um, La Cuesta Santa Barbara High together. Um, so are you saying that you just like um, another chance for us to discuss this and give board direction on, on which site to to uh, propose well, I, a 7-Eleven committee for? Or are you suggesting that we should wait six months? Well, I don't, need to, I don't think we have to wait f for the results of a 7-Eleven committee to make, to make policy decisions and what, what we're contemplating doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a re I have a, maybe it's unrelated, but another couple of notes I, I took. Uh, we haven't heard the costs of the process itself, and and that, and to me that's important. And uh, and then the other part, I'm I'm a little troubled uh, by this kind of uh, staged move. Uh, I used to study and teach uh, Middle Eastern politics a lot, and they have a phrase called the, the camel's nose being under the tent, and uh, and and we don't know what the whole camel looks like. Uh, I would almost, if we're going to really approve this, I, I would rather, uh, or vote on this, I would rather vote on the, on the principle of the, the principle that is the end result, not on a kind of a uh, salami tactic, uh, well, let's move just, just this much this year. Maybe we'll, in fact, just move the, that much. But I think that it would be much more uh, forthcoming to just say, yes, and here's where we're going, and, that's an, and we're approving that. There are so many pieces to this. Plus, we have uh, we have principal from Santa Barbara High School here. We have from from uh, OAS because they're dependent on this the answers to these questions as well. And by taking, as you said, we can't just look at one piece at a time, but we have to look at the whole thing. And we haven't even heard from from them as to why they want 
uh, um, La Cuesta to move out. I mean, I, I, I hear between the lines, and, and not so much between the lines, but I mean, your vision ultimately is that it's going to be more than just two items, two, two operations down there. It's going to be everything. Well, then let's talk about everything. And, uh, and that ought to be what we're voting on, everything, with stage one being blah, blah, blah. We had that on That's the... That's much more forthcoming. We had that on the agenda, c was a couple months ago. Well, I mean, but and on the action agenda. And with the idea, and we realized, wait a second, we may need the space over in Ortega, that it's hard to be able to plan. I mean, I, I think we have that in the background. We have that something to think about. But in the immediate, we know that if we move the offices, we're going to need the bottom space, and that plan may not happen. Well, but it might. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say that on that, on that front, on the La Cuesta front, I do think we're getting ahead of ourselves. We have a recommendation from the facilities master plan to con do a La Cuesta consolidation of Los Alturas and Santa Barbara La Cuesta at the Ortega site. And then there are some proposals on the table to bring more down to Ortega. It will be a different board. There will be perhaps different other ramifications that will have taken place. Exactly. But it's a step forward that is progress for La Cuesta to consolidate those two programs with impacts on, t positive impacts, I might say, on three different schools, given even that partial um, consolidation. So I, I would, you know, like to move forward a little bit. Me too. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, yeah. I'm the one who raised this initially. Um, my, I don't want to wait six months to make a decision, and I agree with you that we ha that there are a lot of other schools who are dependent on whatever decision we make regarding La Cuesta. Even if the decision is no decision, people have to know that what we're doing, and I think um, we sometimes get into trouble when we try keep prolonging decisions and keep schools on tender hooks, you guys all know, um, for a long period of time. So I don't want to drag this out, but I, I would perhaps like one more meeting to discuss what we're doing with what, you know, the, the issue with the district office before we make some f sort of final, or at least relatively final, plans. Because I'm, I'm still a little bit confused about where those programs that are currently housed in Santa Barbara Junior High are going to be placed. Um, and what the cost of housing those <coughs> programs might be. Um, and as Dr. Noel said, what the cost of making the changes would be. Um, you know, so I think we just need to have a little bit more information about what we're going to be doing with this site before we make a final decision about what we're going to do with the Ortega site. But I think if with a, l I, I don't think we have to have the whole the whole plan laid out. I think with a little bit more information, we can make some decisions to go forward. Um, so I'd just like to maybe have have a have a one more meeting where we get a little bit more information about the what we're going to do with with this site and wh how that plays out at Santa Barbara Junior High or whatever other sa the the vacated space at Santa Barbara High School, the La Cuesta site at Santa Barbara High School, or what. Well, he's you know, w how all of that is going to fit in because Mr. Hetyank was saying we're still going to need f five to 7,000 square feet if we try to make the move. So does that five to 7,000 feet come from the Ortega site? Does, where does it come from? Yeah. And, and those are just broad estimates in, in, looking, in looking strictly at square footage occupied and square footage available. We haven't looked at specific functions can they function in less square footage than they are now? Are they in dire need of expansion? Uh, we, we just haven't looked at those things. But, but and, I and I think that's maybe the kind of additional information that we might be able to get relatively, I don't, I don't know, could we get it relatively soon? I, I don't think we can get you enough of that information okay. quickly enough. Um, this, this process of making this decisions and deciding which programs get parceled out to say a Cleveland site or or downstairs Ortega or whichever I, I think will be most of a year-long process I mean, we won't have good answers for a while um, and in fact we'll want to see what 
fall enrollment actually does look like before we move ahead with anything. If I could just make one more comment with regard to La Cuesta, I mean, I, it, it's a great plan that you've put together, but I'm not utterly convinced that all of La Cuesta should ultimately end up on a single site. But I do feel committed to the master plan and to that stage one change. And it will be for another board to make those kinds of decisions. Are we ready to make a motion on that, though? Can, can I make one clerical correction before you do make a motion? On your agenda item, uh, you, uh, it mentions the removal of the academy playground equipment. Instead of equipment, that should say surface. The playground equipment is being relocated with elementary developer fees. Those costs that you have are, are to take the depressed area where there is currently a fall surface, remove that, and fill it in with asphalt. That's, I, that's I, my fault. My bad. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, 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 <laughs> do have, I do have a couple of other questions, <laughs> Laquesta questions, um, that either Mr. Turnbull or Mrs. Abney might be able to answer. Um, and it's, it's really about duplication of effort. My understanding of a, of a true continuation high school is that it's to serve um, the upper high school grades. You know, in, in other words, students wouldn't enter Laquesta in ninth grade. Correct. Okay. So you start, you start the bridge program, not you personally, but you initiate a br bridge program at Santa Barbara High focused on ninth and 10th graders. Does that mitigate the need then for ninth and 10th grade classes in the master schedule? Okay. It's the reason ninth and 10th grade is in the master schedule is because many of our students have failed ninth and 10th grade English. And so right now we're not able to offer them, we just offer English. So what that master schedule is gonna do and the way the standards are written is it's grade 9, 10 and grade 11, 12. So what we'll be able to do is offer them the grade level English that, they, that they're not currently getting, that they probably failed at their high school is one of the reasons that they came to us for credit recovery. And I know one of the other questions that Dr. Sarvis mentioned, let me just throw this at you. Um, we will still be taking 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders. We'll prioritize it. 12th graders first, 11th graders next, 10th graders third. What this, the bridge program will offer is an opportunity to serve 9th graders who are not being served by any program right now, and additional 10th graders who need service. We, you know, our, our enrollment's limited by the number of teachers and the number of classrooms that we have. So if this bridge program is as successful as, as both uh, Dr. Caprito and I think it will be, it will offer the opportunity on each of the campuses to provide at-risk services for kids that aren't getting services now at all. And there will still be plenty of kids that are behind on credits that can use La Cuesta services. Okay, and then are there any impacts on the small necessary schools money that you get? No. Absolutely guaranteed, no impact. Absolutely. Okay. How, what is the ADA you get? Is it the same as, same as everybody? We get general revenue ADA and then, and then each of the four continuation campuses um, has its own CD, um, CDS number and that receives necessary small school funding which is um, blocked into the pupil retention block grant. And part of the, um, the bridge program, um, the, the placing of the bridge program will um, mitigate the loss of any of those funds. So I, on balance, what do you get per student? I don't know. Because the, the necessary small school funding, we're, we don't get all of those funds. We get a proportion of those funds out of the block grant. And so we get what everybody else gets plus some additional funds that's set to supplement um, education for continuation students. But it, that funding, interestingly enough, is based on however many students you had at the day that that school was founded. It's never increased except for a small half a percent a year or something in some kind of a COLA, no, it's not even a COLA, but a small growth. Um, so if you found a school with 50 students um, and you now have 200 students in that school, you still get necessary small school funding for 50 students. You don't know what that increment is per student? It's not, it's not, it's not per student. It's by the number of students that you had at the time that, that well, you- can always divide by the number of students. Well, it's, 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 and I, yes, that's right. Thank you. And I and I don't know what the numbers were when those schools were founded. And that's been lumped into a block grant, so it comes as a chunk of money, not as separate monies. 
It, it used to be an add-on to the revenue limit for continuation yeah. high schools, a hundred, hundred and five, hundred and ten thousand dollars. And you're right, when AB 825 was implemented, that money was basically embedded in the pupil retention block grant. So in terms of your audit trail or any kind of forensic way to track it, it's no longer there right. really. But that's the origin of it. And it used to be that if you open a continuation high school, I think after 1978, 78 right. or 80, I can't remember right. the benchmark year, yeah. that you would get this add-on to the revenue limit for operating a t continuation high school. So if you want to think it in the simplest terms, they get revenue limit plus $25,000 distributed among the four sides. Right. Yeah. Okay. I Thank think, you. I think Ms. Phillips here wants to make a statement, if that's okay. I just do need to put in a <coughs> plug for the desperateness we need uh, of us for space. But before I do, I really want to say to, to Las Alturas that I haven't wanted to come and bug about the space because I hate to lose them. Um, you know, Las Alturas, we've worked together with them providing aids coming into our classrooms through the years and working with our kids, which was really good. Paul has worked with his kids doing an organic garden with our garden manager, and we functioned well together. And Kathy, if when you guys move, you have to give him permission to come back when we have bees. We have <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are desperate for space, and I think all you need to do is come to our school and look in the office space. And in where we have our administration, our office manager, our assistant, our health clerk, our, a couch in the corner where we put the sick kids, um, a space for speech, a space, space for counselor, is in a space that is less than half the size of our classroom. It's insane. In order to have confidential um, discussions, we go outside under a tree. And I mean, that, it's really ridiculous. There are also things like we have wanted to, we have wanted to approach the idea of a preschool, and, but we can't do that until, because I've talked to um, Jenny about it, we can't do it unless we had a space that could be fixed up for a preschool. We can't even think about it. Um, we had wanted to approach with the idea of a homeschool element, but we can't do that without a space for those kids to come in and spend time. This year, I'm, we might be able to start an extra class with the, the kids we have on a waiting list in, in the Middle Ages, but we can't even consider that because there's no place to put them. In addition to the fact that our teachers have no workspace, um, it, it just it goes on and on. We really do need some more space. And so for that reason, I urge you to kick them out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, okay, a lighter moment. I just finished reading a book by a man named Dan Ariely, who's a, uh, a behavioral economist at MIT, and the book is called Predictably Irrational, and I recommend it. And he says that in decision making, and I don't, you, may, you may be able to validate this or not, uh, that the more choices you have, the, uh, the more options you have, the worse your decision making is. <laughs> <laughs> you're too worried about closing an option, and so you're not fully exploring the ones that are right in front of you that are the most available. On that note, would you like to make a notion? <laughs> yeah, I would. I don't know where it'll go, but uh, uh, let's see. I would like to move uh, that uh, we move forward with uh, stage one of um, the La Cuesta consolidation, which includes moving Las Alturas and Santa Barbara La Cuesta to the Ortega campus. I'll second that. Um, would you consider not calling it stage one, mm -hmm. but just simply moving Las Alturas? And uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's, because that's that what the facilities master plan called for. That's, yeah. that's correct. Um, and I only do that because I've looked at, uh, at the schools proposal so many times, um, which I appreciate. But yes, that's fine. And I will remove that from my second goes with that. The motion. <laughs> um, you know, my, my concern with I absolutely am ready to move forward with Las Alturas and Cuesta, La Cuesta Santa Barbara moving together. But um, we if we say now that it's at the Ortega Street site, it could be that that we are dooming ourselves to no rental income. Um, and 
we need to be aware of that. Well, I have to say I'm, I'm going to vote against this, um, and I absolutely think that La Costa and um, the Los Altura site should be together, and I think it probably should be here, but I'm not ready at this point, as I stated earlier, to make that decision prior to having more information about F1. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of, I, I wish that we weren't doing that because I think it has implications for F1 that I would like to not have decided before we make that decision. But I also think that it's probably, you know, it won't be the worst thing in the world. Um, but I'm not gonna, but I'm gonna have to vote against it for that okay. reason. What, could I ask what, um, what information could we get together in say two weeks that would be enough for you to be able to make a decision on that? Well, one of the things that, for example, one of the things I want to look at is wh well, where, when, we, when we're talking about moving this site and we're talking about moving it to uh, the junior high site, and then we're going to move those, the, the areas that are there. And, I, and one of the things that I have to say, I, mi I misunderstood, or either misunderstood or just didn't understand, um, in something that you said, Mr. Hentyunk, was you said that uh, Mr. Becchio said he could give up that shaded area for next year. But my understanding is he doesn't have that shaded area right now because it's currently utilized by all those other programs. Part of that shaded area houses Santa Barbara Junior High classrooms. The area that shaded where the district office used to be houses a combination of Santa Barbara Junior High School programs and the programs I mentioned earlier, uh, Cal SOAP, uh, district nurses, AOK, -okay, child development, gate, gate. Pathfinders. pathfinders. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but Mr. Becky also has some classrooms that are utilized for other purposes that are, uh, that could be take these classes and relocate them to. He doesn't have enough room to do that for this fall. He would most likely have room to do that one year from today with confidence, unless there's a big upsurge of enrollment into Santa Barbara Junior High that, that we don't foresee. I guess to answer your question, Ms. Parker, in order to, to feel more comfortable about making the decision, I have to feel more comfortable about where we're gonna put this facility. Where where it's going to be housed and how we're going to how we're going to do that and not the details about how many square feet etc but just a little bit more information about because right now I feel like and and maybe I miss maybe I'm misunderstanding and maybe other people don't share this this lack of certainty but I feel a, a real uh, question about whether where this facility would end up may I address that we have a real question mark about it as well. Um, and I think it'll take thorough study. I think it'll take a 7-Eleven committee. I don't think we'll be able to even bring you a recommendation until, say, October at the earliest. I mean, I, this is not something we should take lightly or just set a direction and say, oh, gosh, it looks like they'll fit. Let's do it. Uh, I mean, we really do need to give this careful study. Well, and I guess that goes back to the idea of uh, – La Cuesta at Santa Barbara Junior High. Mrs. Harder, can you just speak for a moment? I mean, obviously we have lots of elementary schools on junior high campuses. Um, can you speak for a moment about high schools? I think one of the goals that, and you can go back to the facilities master plan, one of the goals that's enumerated in the facilities master plan is not just the fact that uh, OAS was in desperate need of the space, but also the fact that it's I mean, while Los Alturas has been a great neighbor to La Colina, it's not an ideal situation to have high school students on a junior high campus, and it has impacts on when students come to school and when students leave school because they don't want to interfere with the junior high function. So you're just moving that piece of the puzzle over to Santa Barbara Junior High, and it's the same issue all over again. Um, and at Santa Barbara Junior High, I would say it's an even more difficult issue because at La Colina there's one ingress, there's one egress, and that's not the case at Santa Barbara Junior High. 
So then does it become an issue for Santa Barbara Junior High of ha needing more security because they want to make sure all the high school students are off the campus at the appropriate time before and after you know coming onto campus and leaving campus. Um, so uh, that's, that's what I had in mind. Um, I think when you're talking K-8, it's a different issue than, than 9 through 12 with 7th and 8th graders. We do have a motion in the yeah, second. I, I just wanted to uh, uh, add a, a slightly different twist. I'm, I'm uh, uh, traumatized by our $4 million budget cuts, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I dream at night of next year. Uh, what, two more million? Dream or okay. nightmares? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes. Unless the state's economy gets worse, which uh, and 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 uh, you think that might happen. And you and you have reduced the amount from the time you first presented it from five hundred thousand dollars down to it looks like your worst case now is about three hundred thousand and right. plus some a lag time. D depending then on I, who then the I look at, is. Then I look at the enrollment of this school, one hundred and fifty kids uh, there daily, and I. And I take that three hundred thousand. That's two hundred. That's two thousand dollars a kid. The opportunity costs of moving the school are two thousand dollars per kid. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, not when I look at the two million dollars that we have to cut here. So for me, this is this is very very strongly financial. Uh, I, w I will add that I've had calls uh, about the about the merits of putting all of these students in one place and that and they're not voting on that because it just is only over the one thing but uh, but there are concerns in the community about about a total consolidation of La Cuesta uh, and uh, uh, and an alternative argument that these students belong on high school campuses where they're part of the high school community and I haven't sorted that out myself but I don't hear that as a foolish argument I hear it as an argument that, uh, that I'd like to understand better but anyway the, for me the the money is, it, it, it's about the money, as they say, it's about the money. And, uh, and, I, and uh, as a political scientist, I also uh, uh, don't share Mrs. Uh, Parker's uh, hope. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the dynamic is, is political and almost inevitable, in my opinion. Um, I, I actually have one more question, if you'll indulge me. Mr. Hayank, uh you're doing construction at La Cuesta Santa Barbara, yes, soon? Uh, yes, um, we've opened bids for the project. We haven't brought you the bids for approval yet because I don't want to do that until the Office of Public School Construction officially approves the allocation, which should be next month. And so as soon as they do that, then I would bring you the bids and we would start the renovation. Are you gonna need alternative housing for those students? As of this time, we are hoping not to. Okay. We're, we're planning around that. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm still with Mrs. Parker that the possibility that she raised, he, we know that the process is going to take well into next school year. <coughs> and we know that there's going to be construction at La Cuesta, which may or may not impact students. So I don't really see what the downside is to making the move, even if it turns out to be temporary, although it would be permanent from the Los Alturas side of things. Hmm, well that's an interesting point. Is it so expensive to move it that if it turned out that we couldn't rent out this district space, that a year from now we could say that's not going to work, we need to find an alternative location for uh, La Cuesta Santa Barbara High and Los Alturas to be together and then look at um, creative solutions to having them someplace else so that we could rent that site out. Do you think that that is, having spent the money on the move, that it becomes cost prohibitive to think of moving them again in a year? I, I, w I would say that, that, that the costs given in their proposal are, are mainly physically moving expenses for a moving company to come. If you wanted to, to postpone something, uh, it, it would be postponing the permanent uh, uh, redo of, of the asphalt in, in the back. I don't know how that would affect 
what they plan on doing the first year. I wasn't involved in those conversations. But the actual cost of moving them, there, there, there's office space there, there, there's classroom space there. You don't have to reconfigure or rehab. Uh, all we have to do is, uh, is energize the phone system and, uh, and hand out keys and, and do some cleaning. There's a, can I, I think it's important to realize though, you're talking about a, a population of students who, who really need some pretty solid parameters, they need routine, they've got a great program where they are, better to leave things as they are, figure out the mess or not at the end, rather than potentially creating a migrant population. If it works out here for a year, great. Now you've potentially moved OAS in behind Las Alturas, if Ortega's rented out, then you're gonna have to put the caravan together and start moving them around. So it, I'm speaking on behalf of your staff, I apologize, but as a former principal, I think it's important especially to recognize the population you're dealing with and then what may unravel once you move them off of a, off of a, a regular school campus. Point well taken. But I mean, you know, whatever. I, I, I guess I feel like Given the size of this piece of the property, we're not going to find all the space that we need at Santa Barbara Junior High, and it's gonna require using some of the Ortega site, and I feel like that in and of itself takes a good portion of Ortega off the table. We have a motion on the table. <laughs> Our, calling the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. No. So what do I do now? Uh, bring it back uh, along with everything else on the agenda because we didn't get to it. Um, you, I think you want to bring back F1 and you also want to bring back an agenda item to form a 7-Eleven committee simultaneously. When are we going to do this? I can't even imagine. Um, it's after it the break. Well, no, I, I'm being serious here because we have an entire meeting that we've just spent, um, yeah, we spent all our time on two items which we're gonna bring back both of them. Um, I'm a little frustrated with this uh, and I'm not sure what to do about that. Well, for me, I don't want, I don't want this to be delayed um, much longer um, and I want a decision for the 0809 school year and if we put it off any longer it won't be possible so I do want it to come back but with just some more creative thought about possibilities for facilities so that we have um, so that we can make that without feeling like we are we are um, you know possibly doing a tremendous disservice for all of our students a year from now when we're making budget cuts Okay. Uh, I, well, I think we also may need to have another meeting. I mean, to have a, as a couple. We more. already <laughs> have. I mean, we. <laughs> yes. You know, I hate. I hate the idea of scheduling additional meetings. Probably as much as anybody else. Um, but if we can't get through our agenda, maybe we need to. Okay. To have a sp another special meeting. Or. I don't know. I, I, I share your frustration. I understand what you're saying. Um, and yet this, to me, felt necessary. Okay. Well, we'll try again. Uh, we're going to take a break for uh, 10, 15 minutes. Well, if we do that, we're going well, to... What I would suggest is if we skip item E3 and come back to it, uh, we can do E4 and we can probably rip through a couple of the conference agenda items. Okay, let's take a break. Back, we are skipping, we sent uh, Nathan home, so we are skipping E. We'll move item E3 to the next meeting. <laughs> E3, yeah. And um, let's do E4 real quick. Okay, um, let's, let's fly through these. Case number uh, 0708. Wait. Wait a second, wait a second. We're going to get ourselves all Oh ready my here. God, you guys. Come oh on, <laughs> come on. Get with the program oh, here. Are we ready? What? It's in the other room. Sorry. I'll okay. grab it. Oh. I'll keep track. 0708 47 uh, 
move to approve the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. Harder and Parker. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? No. No. So it passes 3 2 with okay. um, Malakoff and Malakoff Cordero, and Cordero okay. as nos. Okay. Uh, in the case of 0708 67, uh, move to uh, adopt the stipulated agreement. Second. Harder and Parker, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 5 0. Uh, in the case of 0708-69, uh, move to adopt the stipulated agreement. Second. Second. That was Cordero? Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Passes 5-0. In the case of 0708-70, uh, move to approve the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. Harder, Cordero. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes, any opposed? Passes 5 0. In the case of 0708 71, uh, move to approve the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. Harder Cotero. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Passes 5 0. In 0708 73, uh, move to approve the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Oh. Uh, Second. Date change? Jan yes. May, May, January instead of Yes, May. but that was in the packet. Th that was, was the hearing mis, panel. That was just a misprint yeah. on, okay. the, oh, okay. on the. So it was sheet. harder. Did, who second that? Cordero? Cord All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 5 0. Okay. Here, will you need that? Kate, will you hand that to Laura? No, we all got one. Okay. It's, it's for. Thank you. <laughs> They're all the same. <laughs> okay, we're on to um, F. Two. May I ask for clarification on item F1? Mm. Do you want the whole item brought back, or do you just want the Ortega Street rental of Ortega Street school? No, site it's property? it's the district office part of it that you want brought back, isn't that? I, I would think that in or because of the projected impact of the district office on Ortega, I think you're also going to need to take a look on this side and how you would parcel out various. I mean, at least a, a quick We'll guesstimate. bring back the whole item. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. And do you want it on action? Uh, yes. Uh, well, well yeah. not, not in terms of the feasibility, but certainly want Las Alturas and, and, you know, E2, the E2 part should be on action. We'll give you our recommendation then. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then we're on to um, F2, the report on uh, the workers' compensation certification. Anything we need to know? Yes. Eric? <laughs> yeah, this is just a fiscal disclosure item. Ed Code 42141 requires districts to disclose if they have any unfunded costs in their workers' compensation program. We're self-insured through a joint powers authority known as CISC-1. And because we're self-insured through a joint powers authority, it's their responsibility to get the actuarial to determine whether there's unfunded workers' co workers' compensation cost. As you can see from the attached report, um, they're not only fully funded, they're more than fully funded. And this is basically meets that disclosure requirement. So I'm just bringing it to the board so the public is basically informed that um, our workers' compensation costs are fully funded. And no future action would have to be taken on the matter. No. It's just a disclosure. It's just a disclosure. It should be done on an annual basis. Okay. Very good. We're done. Any questions? F3 then. Report and discussion of possible budget advisory committee. Uh, the board r requested that we bring back an item um, describing a potential budget advisory committee. Budget advisory committee is an advisory committee to the superintendent. Um, their advisory, uh, advisory in, in um, their responsibility to make decisions affecting the financial operations of the district and advisory only. Um, generally, the composition of a budget advisory committee is, is determined by the superintendent, but it usually includes students, parents, at least two board members, district school site administration, bargaining units, and the business community. Um, in most cases, it's a standing committee. 
the advantages of a budget advisory committee is that basically it provides another input um, opportunity for stakeholders during the budget process. Um, in my own personal experience, I think the disadvantage of a budget advisory committee is a lot of times it becomes difficult to manage because of the stakeholders' interest. And generally, unless you're going to use some kind of majority vote, um, it's very difficult to reach consensus, primarily because when you have issues that border on being negotiable or whatever the case may be, um, it's very difficult to achieve consensus. So we're bringing this for potential discussion and recommendation or direction from the board if we want to proceed in this respect. And I'd be happy to answer any questions based on my own personal experience. Well, let me also add to that. I think that ha setting up a committee for this purpose uh, then brings recommendations to the board. And I think there's the expectation from the committee that those recommendations will be approved by the board. And I think it takes some of the board's authority away. Well I put. <laughs> I have um, I have a different understanding of a budget advisory committee. Um, I served on a budget advisory committee for Ellen Hancock College. And it, it didn't operate in that way. It didn't make recommendations to the board for one, um, and it wasn't about making budget recommendations per se, it was about um, clarifying budget processes. Um, it, did we, uh, we did often make some recommendations to the budget director for um, assumptions, uh, goals, things like, do we, do we want to try to, sh should we be trying to uh, uh, strive for a 4% a reserve rather than just the minimum 3% reserve? Is that something we think is a goal? Um, but it wasn't, it, it didn't make recommendations like we think you should cut right. this or we think you should add that. I operated in Paso Robles with a forum called a fiscal policy team, which looked at the long range fiscal health of the district and really dealt with those more kind of policy type issues mm -hmm. and then made recommendations to the superintendent that were brought to the board. I think that's more in line with what you're talking about. Generally, the budget advisory committees, it's, it's interesting, nobody wants to operate them until cuts happen and then basically everybody says, why don't you have a budget advisory committee because it's another bite at the apple. In both instances, one of the disadvantages from a staff level is the amount of additional time they require to support the committee because as you know, school finance is a bit complex and then you've got to do the whole bit of education with the committee members and that takes a lot of time in itself. But yeah, when I look at the things that we haven't talked about is there is, a, there is a, a, a forum called a fiscal policy team that I've seen used and I have used in another district, which is more in line with what you're talking about. Right. P uh, part of the purpose of the committee that I served on was um, to help clarify the budget to all the constituent groups within the, the institution because there was a lot of... Um, miscommunication and misunderstanding about what was in the budget, what wasn't in the budget, it, it yeah. helped to create, a, or I thought, and I, I think most people on the campus agreed, that it helped to create a climate in which people felt like everyone was, was sort of on the same page in terms of what existed in the budget. Now, that didn't mean people agreed on how it should be, N how no. it should be parceled out, but people were in relative agreement on what actually was there. I, I'm going to take another page out of my experience. When I was in Berkeley, we had a thing called a resource work group. And what the resource, wor resource work group was basically to increase uh, capacity in terms of the community. And when I say community, I mean the board members, parents, sometimes students, uh, bargaining units, in terms of their understanding of school finance in general and of the district's finances in particular. And we met on a quarterly basis and basically, I felt like I was doing a graduate seminar in school finance. I mean, that's, how, and, and I had that described or parroted back to me that that's how it came across. So, I mean, I didn't mind doing it, but I think that's probably more similar to what you're talking about, was really trying to build some fiscal transparency and basically try to for those who are interested to really explain the nuts and bolts of school finance. So if I wanted to talk about self-insurance funds, 
you know, one time or I want to talk about revenue limit or I want to talk about transportation, you know, all those sexy things, I could do it and people were there to listen. So. Well, I do think fiscal transparency is one of the key goals. And Absolutely. I, and even though I, I agree with you that it probably does become more uh, appealing during the time of fiscal, fiscal crisis, um, I have been asking for this committee for at least four years. So um, it's not something that's new on the... So on there, the there's, there's this whole continuum, uh, and, and I, I've been in all of them, so I'm... <laughs> I guess I've always been disposed to being open to this kind of committee, but I really worry with the reductions in administration that we're going to end up putting a lot of our administrators' time into this kind of committee. Um, and I don't think that we would see the benefits for at least a year or two because I think that there is a learning curve that needs to take place. And I think to uh, get the appropriate stakeholders on the committee, um, is also difficult so that you're not creating lobbying groups. Um, so I, I'm, I just feel like I, it's something I would like to do. I'm not sure that the timing is right given the, the pressure on administrative staff right now. Is that, do you have a recommendation? Uh, well, uh, one of the things that concerns me and especially some of the things we're talking about in the business office, we have you know, we're trying to embrace a continuous improvement model where basically we're looking at all these initiatives. We're going to bring back school services recommendations and give me an implementation plan. And I'm trying to think how we do committee work on top of everything that we're trying to embrace over the next few years to basically get us where I think we need to be. So I guess you're kind of hearing my recommendation <laughs> without me being explicit. Well, Am I whining? <laughs> I'm disappointed that some of the groups that might have participated in this committee aren't here any longer at this late hour um, because I think there might be some benefit. Um, I, I know that there was, in my experience, there was benefit to the entire institution, I think. Um, and it, but I, I, I do th think that it would take careful crafting mm -hmm. um, in terms of a clear, a clear sense of what the purpose of the committee was. Um, and it's not a lobbying opportunity. Um, but I still think it would be helpful to have one. Um. You're going to make me put it back on the agenda <laughs> again. <laughs> I'm just using it. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I'm combining uh, uh, Dr. Sarvis's comments with uh, the expressions of concern about lobbying. Uh, if there's going to be a recommendation to the board, the board is always in the position you described uh, of uh, feeling, feeling, uh, oh, now I, I have to go against this considered judgment of this committee. So the committee becomes the venue for budgetary politics, for lobbying and special interests. And just getting on it, you know, let's, who, who's the stakeholder? I mean, there's, 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 there, there's gold in that, uh, who gets to be on the stakeholder. And, and I don't think, I don't think something that is so, I even if that were it done with great virtue, uh, there would always be the risk that it wouldn't look that way. And, and I don't think that's what the district needs right now. I think the district needs something that, uh, the transparency part I like, and I like uh, the concern of transparency. Uh, there may be other ways to get transparency without burdening uh, staff too much. Uh, Along with transparency, there has to be trust. It seems to me that, uh, and, and that's where that's where we've been hurting for so long, that we 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 don't know whether we can believe the figures or not. Mm -hmm. And so so for me, that moves to the other committee a, a little bit. I, uh, that that the public, if if there's a, something performing kind of an over the shoulder uh, oversight audit function, like the other item on the agenda. The agenda uh, it, it tells the public, relax. They've, 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 they've got, they're, they're guarding, they're guarding themselves. Uh, this is self-corrective. And, and I think, uh, I, I'm not even, I mean, I'm a member of the public, but I'm also on the board. Boy, I want to hear that. Because I don't really like to have to dive into budgetary details. 
I'd like to stay at the top and just mm -hmm. listen. <laughs> and you know, I mean, they're, they're, I, I came on the school boards for educational reasons, not to become a, a, a budgeteer. And and uh, uh, and I want to believe in, in the system. And I, and and other people I know want they want to believe that this is now being managed well. That there are correctives correctives built into the system. Uh, that okay, everything's fine. Get it out of my mind and get on to other business. Can, can I just ask for clarification? Why, Doctor Noel? Why do you feel that one committee's recommendations would be a usurpation of the board's authority, and another committee's recommendations would not? Well, they're entirely different committees, and, uh, and yeah. Uh, um, and so, what's the diff what's the distinction that would make one recommendation? Appropriate and another one. I haven't thought through the audit committee that carefully. I want to hear uh, Mr. Smith, but my vision of the audit committee is that it reports uh, more than it that more than it recommends. It just tells you what's gone on and uh, and and it involves. I, re I recall your description of it before that it has outside people. Okay. Well, let's move on. Let's ask him for a report. Let's find yeah. out. May, okay. May I ask though for direction on this item um, on the budget? Uh, advisory committee because a couple of people have spoken to transparency in explaining the budget and I think we all find that fairly appealing and I'm wondering if there are ways that that we can do that that aren't so burdensome and maybe Eric and I can have that discussion bring something back to you if yeah. that if that, that okay I see it in terms of well, transparency I, I think part of it is the SAC system I mean it is it is a fundamentally opaque bloody system mm -hmm. Well, huh? I, ha I also, I, I want to agree with, with Dr. Sarvis about bringing that back, but I also want to say that I'm hearing the budget committee described as if this is what it has to be. And we can create a budget committee in any permutation we want it to function. In my experience, it did not function as a, as a recommendation body. It didn't make recommendations to the board. It never had any interaction with the board. Um, so, it, it, I mean, if we can decide, if, if we think that there's a, a function that a budget committee could serve or some, any committee th could, could serve that would help to uh, clarify the budget process and would help to get everybody sort of on the same page with the budget, we can create it to do that. And we can create it so that it doesn't do any, or so that it's not empowered to do any of the things that we don't want it to do. I, I think part of it is the nomenclature. If we're gonna bring something back, don't call it a budget advisory committee or a budget committee because those have a distinct connotation in school districts. They mean that they're gonna put forth recommendations whether they're going to be enhanced or reduced programs. I, I think what I'm hearing you say is, Something more along the lines when I was in Berkeley with the resource work group. It's basically about fiscal transparency and building understanding of school finances and, and how that's conveyed. I think Dr. Sarvis and I probably need to think a little bit about how that would operate and how, how we could put that forth. I know when I did it last, I mean, basically, I just set the agenda and I tried to take people from A to Z and teach them everything I could about school finance as it related to the district's finances. And, you know, and so the idea was basically I'd have people in the community that understood the budget almost as well as I did. Well, maybe not that well, but, but. Weird. Well, I just also want to say the same thing about the audit committee. I don't want us to talk about it as though it already exists and we have to operate within a certain structure. I, I mean. I agree with you and I think that I wanted to hear w about the audit committee and maybe we can fashion something that does a little bit of both. Um, since I'm not sure I'm sold on this idea of an audit, so maybe something in between. So I'm willing to be open to that. So. I, I think the audit committee, the audit committee, its function I is, is you know, a traditional budget committee is more perspective. An audit committee is more reflective. You look at things, basically, have they been done correctly? Have internal controls been met? You know, you, you work with looking at the systems and making sure that your internal controls are strengthened. You look at disclosure elements, like something we just went through a minute ago. The audit committee should basically be reviewing probably a a list of documentation to make sure that those things are happening on a regular basis and if they're not then basically you know staff should be taken to task because they're not you know so 
it has more of a control or oversight function as opposed to any kind of policy implications. Well, maybe we shouldn't put the nomenclature on it then yet so that we don't have a, an I idea of the definition of what it should or shouldn't do. And we, you could bring forward what you think would be an, a good uh, format or structure for not a for whatever we want to call it, a, a committee to are take. You, are you thinking about combining a and couple then, of different things? Well, right? yeah, I think we're, well, I'm not sure that, I'm, I don't want to say yes, we're thinking about combining. I'm saying, I think we have some, and, and I'm saying we in the broadest sense because I don't think they're necessarily the same ideas, but I, I think we all have some ideas of what we would like to see these committees do. Right. And they may or may not fit Divergent what you interest. would normally call a budget committee or an audit committee. Um, it may be something totally outside of. Or it could be an amalgamation. Or it could, of, yes. Okay. Well, maybe you should define them functionally. You've got two different possibilities here. Basically, here are the functions we want performed. Well, we could certainly have both, but I, I am, or some amalgamation, but for me, a priority would be the audit committee, but I don't know if that's what business services sees as the priority. Um, or if you think that both committees are ones that would take up so much of your time that it would be detrimental to services for our students and staff. Well, I, I think one of the issues with the audit committee, most of the production already happens statutorily. I mean, because you're looking at, you're looking at things that you've already prepared you know, whether the, the budget reports, the interim reports, whatever the case may be, or things you should be preparing, you know, working with your, you know, independent auditor. So I, I don't see a great deal of additional work there other than the meetings, you know, and, and it all depends on how often you meet, too. I think one of the issues that an audit committee has great benefit in is that basically if you do have things that, like, you know, if we contemplate going forward with a parcel tax measure, that if it's been vetted through the audit committee, sometimes those things lend great credibility if you have the right people on that committee, you know. And generally, as you see from my agenda item, you know, you want people that are well respected in the business community because we were talking about, I think Dr. Noel talked about trust a lot of time, and we call it credibility. Those are the issues you try and basically bolster. Um, through an audit committee and showing that you're doing, you know, good fiscally transparent work. That sounds like a recommendation. Well, if I had my druthers, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would go there um, as opposed to, you know, well, I would but, go there. But as, as Parker asked, do you, do you think you need either? I mean, do you... Well, ideally, if we weren't doing everything else, I, I think we need both. But I, I don't, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just wondering if we can do everything at this time. It's an organizational capacity issue, is what it is. Well, gosh, let's bring both these items back. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but Any? on the action agenda, preferably. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else? Any uh, last thoughts before we go back to the consent agenda? No? Okay, let's get this meeting on the road here. Um, we have a lot of consent agenda items. D3 uh, was the first one. Well, yeah, D3. Uh, that was Mr. Me, uh, Dr. Noel? I'm trying, trying to get back to it and move my nose. Oh, uh, we're spending a lot of money both in terms of D3, that's uh, the uh, personnel, right? No, no. no that's the he's travel, he's but we also travel. have, have yeah. Avid in, in, in the other one. And I've noticed that on past uh, items, we spend a lot of money on Avid. Uh, it's, my, it's my normal question. Do we have any studies about that show that this money is well spent. I've heard a lot of, a of anecdotes. I went to an AVID uh, meeting uh, down at the Doubletree, uh, which was more like a prayer meeting than a, than a scholarly meeting or a, a, a presentation of uh, 
of evidence that they have an effective program. Uh, and I just, I, I know this is a major commitment of the district, but along with such a commitment, there ought to be a commitment to evaluate the program outside evaluation. Somebody look at it and say, here's what's happening. We don't. Ha having said that, I'm prepared to vote. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first of all, this is the third year of a three year commitment. Um, as far as outside studies, no, I don't, I don't know offhand if AVID has commissioned any outside studies. That's I, not what I mean by outside. I mean an external review of our program. That would come through. Our implementation. That would come implementation through. Implementation is everything. Correct. That would come through both the principals and through Dr. Hayden in terms of student achievement in particular. And I think it would, come in, in, it would have to come in the form of a pre-post, probably same cohort over the last three years, meaning well, next year being the, the, we would look backward at the third year. So no is the answer, but yes, there is absolutely capability. One of the pieces that the AVID organization um, quotes all the time is the increased number of students that are going on to college. So that would be something also, of course, that's tied to student that's achievement. The proof of the but that's the proof that's right there. That's what it's all about, right? Right, exactly. Right, we just haven't, because of the implementation, the phases of implementation, we haven't gotten to the point where we have a senior avid class that then has any sort of real admissions see I would expect if it's if it's working that we would see also some other things going on like the uh, number of A to G course completions going up and I've looked at those data and they're not going up so I uh, that's and, and I don't I'm I not saying that that's evidence that avid fails but I, I I'd like to see some evaluation that looks at these kind of criteria is this money well spent okay we spent a lot of money on, uh, what was his name, the guy from, from Brazosport? Sport? Oh, Gerald, yeah, Anderson. Gerald Anderson. Gerald Anderson. Yeah. There's a lot of snake oil out there. Uh, Gaming okay. the test. Okay. That's all I wanted Move to say. Move to approve. That. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. We move on to D5. I pulled that, and it's because this happens every time someone uh, files a candidate statement they uh, this has happened to me the yeah. county asks you to pay the entire cost up front for a full page and then you get a reimbursement months later and the I point of this policy i got another bill <laughs> right the yeah, point of this policy is to prevent that from happening from having to pay all of mm -hmm. the fee up front so it's a there's a lack of communication we will again go to the county yeah okay it just it concerns me knowing that there is, mm -hmm. you know, a school board election on the horizon in the fall, and someone could walk in to file a statement thinking that they're, you know, prepared to pay for a quarter of a page, and then potentially missing the deadline because they can't put that money together. Yeah. Good point. Okay, so move to approve. Yes, second. second. <laughs> Motion second. Uh, it was Parker, Parker and Harder. And Harder. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and we have... Um, D D10 is next. Yep, D10. Aye. Uh, same question. Uh, this one, in fact, did, did you, I asked one time for a report on the, how we spent the safety money. You gave me that, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, which you... But this is a big chunk I'm, I'm looking at. Mr. Smith. Gotcha. This is a big chunk of it. Correct. $175,000. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, same question as with Abbott. I, I, I see this year after year. We spend this money. I'd really like to see some kind of an external evaluation of, of the effectiveness of the program. There was, when I put this forward in the fall, I can't remember which month it was. It was either very late August or beginning of September. I. I also included the report that showed number of students served by grades, um, suspension data, uh, sort of recidivism, recidivism from... Who wrote, who wrote the report? Uh, it was uh, West Ed contracted out by what? CADA, oh. I then believe. I, then I, I'll have to go reread the... So, Rand? No. I'm sorry. Yeah. Excuse me. Studied Rand. our schools. There, as part of their, their federal grant, they're required to have an external body take a look at them, collect all their data, including Healthy Kids Survey and a variety of other things, and then give it back to them. Now, you know, you can argue whether or not 
you know, garbage in, garbage out. The data that they gave them was necessarily the perfect data. However, yeah. a study was done. It was included in the in the the uh, yeah. agenda item way back when. This is before the fall report, obviously, and this is a continuation of the same program. And in fact, what it does is meet our Title IV No Child Left Behind school safety requirements yeah. that are unfunded. So it actually removes a burden while meeting a requirement. I always raise the question and I always vote for it. So. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes 5 0. D 11. Um, I pulled it. Um, it has to do with some of the providers. And, I, you know, I know that we've approved these before, so maybe I missed the boat in the past, but some of the providers uh, offer their services in the home. Um, and that raises liability issues from, from where I stand. Um, depending on who is present in the home when they come to provide the services. And I don't even know if, if many people even use them. It may be that they all use the other provider that, that is available on the school site at the end of the school day, but I, I just think that this raises alarm bells. I'm sorry, is it? The home of the provider or the home of the student? The home of the student. Mm. I do know there are some parents that have taken advantage of this. Um, that, you know, all of the providers are approved by the state, but I understand there are some. I guess then the question is what kind of insurance policies do they have? I don't know the answer to that. We can find out. Okay. Should we hold this one off? Well, it says, it says the insurance is uh, at least $1 million for each person and $1 million for all accidents or occurrences for all damages arising, blah, blah, blah. We also are having our fair on May 15th, I believe, and so we need to have the, I mean, if we can, if the insurance policy looks okay, we should try to get these in place because we are having the fair to get the, you know, the all the notices have been out there. Well, I guess I would leave that to Mr. Smith to to identify whether or not that kind of coverage is adequate. Yeah, and that's that's our standard insurance requirement. And I, it looks like this contract's also been reviewed by our legal counsel. Okay. Okay. Move to approve. Second. Uh, Harder, Parker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Move on to D13, which I had as well as somebody else did. That was I. I go ahead. Uh, my, my question was about, um, on the second page, about the uh, retirements. Um, are these new retirements, a new, new teacher and then one rescinded? Just go ahead a question about that. DP was on the list before. Well, the, the he's just revising the retirement. The, yeah, the first one is just a date, re, a revision of the date. The second one is a rescission. The the third one is a new retirement, and the fourth one. So the new retirement, know. do we do they come under the same program that we? No. 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 Oh, so somebody retires at this point. Yes. It's yeah. without the. Okay. M missed the deadline. Yes. But the next one does look like a well, classified employee. Classified. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Because I don't know. Move to approve. Oh, well, Second. I, 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 well, we've got another yeah. issue. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, on the first page, on the consultants, I don't see what budgets these are being charged against, or do I misunderstand something here? Uh, I'm, I'm looking, for example, at uh, guest oboe. English horn player, guest pianist. Those are part of our um, elementary in instrumental music program. No, this is Dos Pueblos High School. DP, oh, I'm sorry. For a theater production. You know yeah. what? Some of the same people <laughs> are you oh, both. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't look that far. I can only, well, there, there are two that are, are self-explanatory. The art and music block grant, the second line down, the fourth line, again, a do donation. Yeah. I can only hazard a My guess. My guess is that it's the theater arts boosters the, at Dos Pueblos. Correct. That's, that was exactly, the, what, but again, it's hazarding a What guess. is it? <clears throat> it's TAB, theater arts boosters. Oh, 
okay. But well, that, I, that's just an educated guess. It's yeah. not a certainty. I'd sure like to understand that better. I, I mean, I, I thought we had. I thought we there was had a range. We used to have a column here. It said whether what the source was. Well, that, I think that's what they thought that they were being clear, but they're not well, being not clear. Correct. Yeah. That's what that column is for. Yeah. Well, if that's, I mean, if, if that's out of the general fund, I have concerns about it. If that's out of the unrestricted general fund. Oh, I'm sure it's not. Well, so could we, based could, we on uh, could we not vote on these two items until we get a, a clarification on that? Can you approve that contingent upon it being uh, not from the general fund mm -hmm. for those two theater items? Yeah. If you report back, I actually made the motion and I well, accept we would that. We bring it back. I mean, it would not be approved. <laughs> and I seconded it, and I'll okay. accept that yes. that as well. So I have a motion and a second. Okay. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, it passes. Five zero, and that is all of our D's. And we are at the end of our meeting for coming events. We've already had those. Oh, so. uh, coming events. I have a list of um, assignments for awards and graduations here. Uh, oh, I see there. Yes. Okay. Board comments and correspondence. I have, a, I have a future agenda item, which may not be a future agenda item. It's probably more of a board brief kind of thing. And that is, I don't know if it's possible. We had this conversation in our secondary advisory committee and it came up tonight. Uh, report on the numbers of seniors who met their A through G requirements. Um, and the district used to produce um, a, a count of students going to four-year universities, students attending UC, student, students attending CSUs, mm -hmm. and uh, City College. And I don't know that we keep, if individual principals keep tabs, but I think that we should be. Do you mean that you already saw the report on A through G requirements? Because we produce that as part of seabeds every yeah. year, every fall. Okay, okay, but thank now, you. But uh, now, the number of students going to four-year institutions, though, I don't know. Uh, Davis, can you tell us? Um, well, when Joe left uh, UCSB, uh, we sort of had a, a, a slowdown in what we got from UCSB in terms of their numbers. We can get Cal State numbers because they're actually on our web page, although it doesn't produce it in a very nice, tidy way, but we can extract it from it. But we just joined CalPass. You gave the approval for that uh, last month. Yes. And that will actually allow us to get all that data much quicker. But we used so to have our high schools compile that now at the end of the year, knowing who they expected to go to. Oh, I never knew that. Community college, who they expected to go to other universities. The counseling department still do senior surveys, they yes. essentially, but they're not as accurate as they could be because a lot of them have multiple acceptances, and then you're not quite sure. So it's. You're measuring, <coughs> excuse me, you're measuring at the time they go out the number of kids who have received an acceptance, not the number of kids who actually attend. Mm -hmm. there, there are various issues. Um, Santa Barbara High is using a software program called Naviance now that um, allows students to actually input things, including their email, and retroactively answer the question. So you can actually have local data about where the, the bodies went. So. But, when we get that data, is it broken down by subgroups? Uh, yes, it can be. They're still learning how to use all the features of Naviance, so I don't want to answer that part for them. The CalPass data will be. Okay. Yes. Okay. In fact, the CalPass data um, really will be the accurate data. I mean, it shows who actually went and shows how they did. Okay, I take back my request. <laughs> I have a future agenda item, Madam President. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, I, I wonder if it would be possible to get a report on the budget freeze, budget spending freeze, rather. Well, I, you look puzzled. Uh, what, what kind of report? How much have we 
not spent. You you should be. That should be reflected. Well, actually, you're going to get that automatically because yes, that'll be reflected would, yeah. in the third interim. Uh, the reason I ask is because uh, occasionally I actually do read the warrants, and uh, uh, and the freeze went in effect in, in like in February, and I see things coming through in March and April uh, on the warrants that look like they uh, I would have expected them to be frozen. And, and I know there's a lag uh, from you know, when, when the requisitions were issued. Uh, I guess the, the, that's what the, nothing should have been issued after well, the. Well, remember, the we, we categoricals. Categoricals and also no, things where we're, we're mission critical, like copy paper or toilet paper, we let yeah. those things go yeah. through. And you know, we reviewed positions on a case by case basis. But okay. what we hope to show you at third interim is. Basically, at second interim, we didn't contemplate any of those savings in our projections in terms of what the year-end ending balance would be, and we hope to show you the growth in the ending balance from second to third interim, and it's mostly going to be attributed to that. So that should, does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Well. A little bit? A little. <laughs> okay. Well. Let's give that I, I, a stab, it, and then we'll you know, see. It, I, I, it's basically an oversight question. It has to do with you know what, what, what in fact uh, has been the effect of it. What did we in fact freeze, or have we been freezing, and what have we been uh, approving? Seven. Well, I can tell you that basically, as far as requisitions that deal with the fours, fives, and sixes, which are you know the discretionary objects on the unrestricted side, every single one's come across my desk. So, and I've sent several so back. I, you know, I, I just asked for an agenda item. I, okay. I didn't ask for the report now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say it was next week? It's <laughs> worth hmm? And <laughs> we're still on agenda items. Yeah. Oh, we do apparently have agreement to an additional meeting in June, June 17th at 4 o'clock. Okay. And I believe that email has gone out. Thank you. Oh, I haven't seen that Tuesday. Yes. Probably, yes. yes. Okay. Anything else? We're adjourned. <laughs>